Meet Joey, a digital marketer. He works as the head of digital marketing for Amazon. But how did Joey get here? A few years ago, Joey began to see a large number of opportunities popping up in the field of digital marketing. To begin his entry into the field, he needed to understand what exactly digital marketing was and what was so great about it. First, Joey learned that digital marketing was a form of marketing through which you could advertise to people digitally. Digital marketing leveraged different channels like search engines, websites, social media platforms, emails, and mobile applications. It would give marketers the opportunity to interact with and understand their audience better and to increase the trust in their brand. Digital marketing would also show marketers advertisements to people based on their actions and preferences on the internet, while being less expensive than traditional forms of advertising. After understanding the main concepts of digital marketing, Joey realized there was more to digital marketing than he initially thought. There were also many types of digital marketing, types like content marketing, search engine optimization, pay-per-click, social media marketing, email marketing, and affiliate marketing. And once he understood those types, he set up a digital marketing campaign for his uncle's e-commerce website. Let's have a look at what he came up with. First, Joey created content like blogs, videos, infographics, and case studies so that he could generate audience interest in the brand's products or services. This was content marketing. Next, he needed his audience to actually see his content. The first step was to create content on specific search keywords that were relevant to the target audience. Joey would make optimizations on the website and have credible websites linking back to the content. And lo and behold, the website began ranking on the first page of the search results. By continuous optimizations, Joey would continue to improve the ranking and ultimately make the website rank at the first position. This was SEO or search engine optimization, and Joey could do all of this without spending a single penny. He could also drive traffic to the website with advertisements, but for this, he would have to pay a certain fee each time the ads were clicked. He could have text ads that show up in search engine results, image ads and video ads that show up in websites, and much more. This was possible with the help of PPC, or pay-per-click. However, Joey wasn't done yet. To reach a larger audience, he needed to tap into social media platforms. He would use social media platforms like LinkedIn, YouTube, Facebook, and Instagram to advertise the brand's content. He would use these platforms to advertise the brand's products or services with posts, images, videos, and more to bring out the brand's story and engage with the brand's audience, who spend a lot of time on social media. Like PPC, he could use the platform to advertise the brand's products or services with text, image, and video ads, which needed to be paid for. That's social media marketing. Joey realized that a large amount of the audience weren't visiting the brand's website a second time. He needed to keep them engaged, nurture them, to make sure they purchased the product. For this, he would send them emails that helped them better understand the products they visited on the website and assist them in the buying process. He would also send emails to advertise his products or services to potential customers, that is, with email marketing. And finally, although Joey was able to grow the brand's funnel, he wanted more traffic from third-party websites. This could be achieved with affiliate marketing, Affiliates would promote the brand or product to their audiences for a fee with the help of email signups, registrations, conversions, subscriptions, etc. After setting all of this up, Joey had the hardest part of the process to get through, the wait. Now, as we wait for the results, let's take a break and look at a quiz. Which one of the following forms of marketing involves engaging and nurturing your audience to make sure they buy your products or services? A. SEO B. PPC, C, email marketing, D, affiliate marketing. Let us know your answer in the comment section below for a chance to win an Amazon voucher. Now, let's see what happens at the end of Joey's wait. Although Joey had worked really hard on each of these forms of digital marketing, he only had moderate success. That's when Joey realized he had to gain more knowledge and experience. So he decided to get certified and get ahead in his career with the help of Simply Learn. He took up Simply Learn's digital marketing certification and got the skills and training he needed to become an expert digital marketer. And now, you know where he is. You too can do the same and grow in your career by clicking on the top right corner.
And with that, we've given you an introduction to all the major concepts of digital marketing. We hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, a thumbs up would be really appreciated. Here's your reminder to subscribe to our channel and to click on the bell icon for more on the latest technologies and trends. Greetings everyone, this is Rob Sanders and today we're going to talk about what is digital marketing. So thanks for joining us here at Simply Learn and let's get started. So today we're gonna to talk about why digital marketing is important in today's world. Uh, we're also gonna talk about what is digital marketing and the types of digital marketing channels that are out there. Then we're going to talk about the customer life cycle in digital marketing. So what does it take to get somebody from point A to point Z through digital marketing? And so those are the topics we're gonna to cover. So hope you enjoy yourself while you're learning and let's get right to it. So let's start talking about why digital marketing is important. So let's start there on the why. So we're just a fly on the wall and we're in an office environment. We're looking at two friends having a conversation about digital marketing. So really, if we're listening in, everybody, every marketer is using digital marketing for his or her business. Now, digital marketing has become more popular than traditional marketing. That's not a surprise. So in response, hey, over the past few decades, digital marketing has evolved at a rapid pace. These days, a lot of people spend most of their time on the internet. So what happens in the internet every 60 seconds? Well, a lot happens every 60 seconds. So according to social media today, I mean, there's a lot of snaps, there's a lot of clicks, there's a lot of text, there's a lot of videos watched, there's a lot of pictures being taken, there's a lot of voice activated activity going on, a lot of tweets, emails, swipes. There's a lot going on here in 60 seconds. So there's a lot of activity on the internet, a lot. And so the one gentleman says, hey, can you also mention a few differences between digital and traditional marketing systems? And then the expert responds, of course, I can certainly clarify a few differences between digital and traditional. And so he goes on to say what the differences are between traditional and digital. And let's look at that. Okay, so on traditional marketing, we're talking about print, radio, billboard, newspaper, TV, anything that's not on your mobile or laptop. So we know with traditional marketing, reach is limited. With digital marketing, reach is maximum. And what we mean by that is, hey, when you print something, you're printing it for X amount of people. If you're trying to promote an event and you basically create a thousand flyers, okay, you figure that's going to a thousand people, maybe they'll share it. So you're looking at about 2,000 people maybe just to be generous. Well, digital marketing, we're promoting an event. We can promote it to a whole lot of people depending on the platform. So 2,000 is nothing when you're targeting an audience on Facebook or Google search. Traditional marketing, non-versatile. And with digital marketing, very versatile. So again, going back to our flyer, print an eight and a half by 11. Okay, that's it. You know, with, with digital marketing, you're running display banners, you have 468 by 60, 200 by 200, 250 by 250, 300 by 300. I mean, the list goes on on the types of different display sizes, not to mention text ads, not to mention video or multimedia. Uh, so there's a lot you can do to get your message out there. Okay, with traditional, it's always delayed communication. Okay, so meaning if you're trying to get that TV spot, there might not be a spot open until one in the morning. Okay, well, with digital marketing, there is no hours. Okay, you can certainly get your point out there and have people see it instantaneously. So with traditional marketing, there's a lack of real-time results. I mean, this seems like uh, it's obvious, but you know, digital marketing, that's one of the biggest benefits. Instant real-time results, instant. Okay, nowadays, go to analytics, you can look at real-time reporting. Okay, so we could see real-time results. Okay, traditional marketing can be very costly. I mean, if you're not only doing postcards and printing postcards, but you have to mail those postcards. So there's postage fees. Where with digital marketing, it's very, very, very cost efficient. I mean, meaning you could pick and choose who you wanna target, when you wanna target, where you wanna target, what you wanna target, 
And if you're doing search, you can put your bidding in place. You can put your hours in place. You can really control how much you actually spend. So that to me is one of the biggest advantages to digital marketing. Not only do you get real time results, but you can control costs and then obviously optimize based on the amount of cost you're spending based on those real time results. With traditional marketing, it's difficult to reach a target audience. You know, with digital marketing, it's easy to reach a target audience. I mean, you know, I don't want to bash traditional marketing too much. I mean, if you're going to put a TV ad in place, you know, you're going to do it on a TV show that tends to gear more towards your target audience, but that doesn't guarantee anything. Here we can simply go to Facebook or Twitter or LinkedIn and just pick and choose specifically who we want to target when we want to target them. So it just becomes a lot easier to reach a targeted audience on a digital marketing platform. And then with traditional marketing, poor campaign measurement. With digital, you have easy to measure and optimize campaigns. And what we really mean by that is because you get instant time results, because you can control costs, because you can reach your target audience more easily, all those are a result of Okay, you can measure and optimize. Based on what our audience is seeing and how much they're spending to see it, we can quickly make adjustments in order to optimize the campaign for better performance. So that's generally what that means. That's a culmination of pretty much everything that we've listed as a benefit for digital marketing. Okay, so now why digital marketing has been answered with all the benefits that it carries. Let's talk about the what is digital marketing. So you know that you know you want to do digital marketing. So how do we go about that? What what is it exactly? Well, let's just define it. Digital marketing is just the act of promoting a company's product or an individual's product or service with the help of a device or technology. And so obviously when we talk about device, we're talking about maybe a laptop, we're talking about a mobile device, and when we talk about technology, it could be an app, it could be you know, a cloud-based platform, okay? It could be a piece of software, okay? So a lot going on on the digital side in terms of variations and what you can do. But that's in a nutshell what digital marketing is. You're really just using technology to promote your product or service. So we know because of the benefits in digital marketing, you can promote your campaign on different platforms. Okay, so all those benefits we mentioned about instant real-time results, cost efficiency, optimizing campaigns, you could do that on search, you could do it on social, via email, on mobile apps, etc. So that's what we mean by with the help of digital devices and technology. Well, these digital devices and technology come in the form of search engines and emails and mobile apps, etc. So when we want to go and promote our product or service using a campaign, we have different options. So there are different types of digital marketing channels that we could choose from. And let's just go through that list of digital marketing channels. And the first one is what I consider the king of them all, and that's SEO. So SEO stands for search engine optimization. There's search engine marketing, there's email marketing, affiliate marketing, social, content, mobile, and then we can get into subsets of each of these digital marketing channels. But really, we'll start with SEO because that's the king. And to me, that's basically increasing the quality and quantity of relevant organic traffic on the search engines, including Google. So depending on where you're located in the US market, Google tends or has a large market share. So you want your pages on your website to be found and clicked on organically. And so that means if somebody types in a keyword, you want that relevant page to show up first on Google so somebody can click on that link, okay? And we know that millions of people, specifically in the US, but worldwide, use search on a daily basis. So if you're ranking for those relevant keywords, you can imagine how much traffic you can get. Okay, so that's SEO, okay? And here's an example. So you type in online shopping. Well, you can see the first listing here is a paid search ad. And we're gonna get to that in a minute. The second, organically, is Amazon, okay? So online shopping, you think maybe Walmart, you think maybe Alibaba, or you're thinking probably Amazon, okay? So no surprise, Amazon's ranking for the keyword online shopping. And so if somebody clicked on their listing, 
That's traffic for Amazon. Let's move on to search engine marketing, you know, known as SEM or pay per click or cost per click or PPC or CPC or sponsored search or Google ads. I mean, there's a lot of different names synonymous with SEM. So search engine marketing is really just using paid ads on search engines. Just as we saw the previous example, if you want to be found for a keyword, you don't have to worry about organic if you're willing to pay for it. You just bid on that keyword and voila, you have the opportunity to appear number one in the search results at the top of the page for that keyword. Now, when somebody clicks on it, you have to pay Google if it's Google you're advertising on, but that's the beauty of search engine marketing. You can bid on keywords and appear at the top of the search results for that keyword. Example here, if we go back to online shopping, well, myus.com is bidding on that keyword online shopping. So they're actually appearing above Amazon's organic listing, but that's what they wanna do. They wanna be found for that keyword. So if they're not ranking for it organically, well, they're bidding on it. And if somebody happened to click on that listing, then myus.com is gonna pay Google something depending on what the cost per click is. And so that could be anywhere from one penny to a hundred dollars. It depends, depends on the keyword, depends on who else is bidding on the keyword, depends on the location, depends on the time of day, depends on quality score. There's a lot of factors involved and regarding what you pay. However, the benefit of SEM is visibility and getting traffic to your website for keywords you're not found for. So that's why SEM is such a popular choice for a lot of companies. Okay, let's talk about digital marketing. That's a traditional type of digital marketing channel. It's been around a long time. You know, we all send emails on a daily basis and we probably all receive emails on a daily basis. It's just an effective way to capture leads and convert them to customers because with email, you can personalize your emails and you could send your emails to a segmented audience. Okay, so if you have emails from females who are 35 years of age to 44 that live in say the southern part of the United States, you can segment that send them an email and cater that email directly to that audience. And of course, you can put some nice call to action in there. You can design it really snazzy and you can track it just like you can any other digital marketing channel. So email is a very effective way to really reach a target audience because everybody, for the most part, has a functioning email account. So Basically, here's an example of an email that could go out. If you're selling a product and the product's promotion is about to end, well, you know, get that email out to your target audience. Let them know, that, hey, you have until tonight to purchase the product. And if you purchase it, you're gonna get 30% off. And you can put the coupon code right in there with a nice call to action and you can measure how many people click on that email, go to that web page, and purchase the product using that coupon code. So that's an example of email marketing. Okay, we have affiliate marketing. So affiliate marketing is an effective way for digital marketers to basically create a sales force of people. So basically what you're doing is you're getting merchants to promote your products and services. And you're using usually a third party broker like Commission Junction or CJ.com as an example to introduce you the, the person selling the product, the merchant, with the affiliate. So that affiliate could likely be a merchant, him or himself. And they can basically be a good partner of yours by publishing your product or service on their website so that they can sell in order to get commissions. So it's all based on a commission. So you basically are gonna use a third party affiliate like CJ Get all these affiliates to work for you. They're gonna promote your product or service. If they do sell your product or service, you're gonna pay them a commission. That's more or less how it works with affiliate marketing. And you know, with affiliate marketing, to me, it's a good way to you know really promote your product or service, and you can pick and choose the affiliates or the publishers of whom you wanna work with. So here's an example of affiliate marketing at work. Okay, you basically see a banner, basically 
You can see earn up to 12% advertising fees with a trusted e-commerce leader. Okay, so if somebody clicked on that and purchased, for example, or joined, you could pay off that commission. Okay, let's turn our attention to social media marketing. So social media marketing, you know, I wouldn't say it's fairly new. I mean, if I think about it, we're in 2019, and I remember talking about Facebook back in 2006. So you're talking about 13, 14, 15 years of social media. It's definitely evolved over the years. And, but the concept remains the same. It involves creating different types of content depending on the platform. Okay, so you could be on Pinterest or Instagram and be dealing with photos. Or you could be on Twitter tweeting out certain characters up to a limit. Okay, so it really depends on the social media platform uh, that really drives the type of content you're going to promote. But we know social media can be effective because people use social media. I mean, Facebook is one of the more popular platforms. And if you want to get your product or service out there, you could certainly pay to have an ad on Facebook or you could just post your content organically. Okay, that's the beauty of social. Most of your social platforms like LinkedIn and Twitter and Facebook and Pinterest and Instagram, they all have a paid form of advertising that you can use to promote your product or service. Or you can go the organic route and you know post content organically in hopes of driving traffic back to your website. So with social, you do have two options here, but social is interesting because there are a lot of different social media platforms out there. It really depends on your product or service. Okay, so an example of social media marketing, especially on Facebook. With Facebook, you got mobile and desktop, and you obviously have the opportunity to post something organically and have that liked or commented on or shared, or you could post an ad and get that liked, commented or shared or clicked and have people go back to your website and fulfill the goal of what you want them to do. So moving on to content marketing. So content marketing is really an effective way of really distributing valuable content online. And when we talk about content marketing, you know, we're talking about different types of assets. So it could be simply text in the form of a blog post, or it could be a video, or it could be an, an infographic, or it could be an image, okay? There are lots of ways to create content these days, especially in digital marketing. And the great thing about content marketing is you're writing content for a targeted audience. So if you're trying to target an audience on say Instagram, then you know who your audience is and you know what the type of content you're gonna post on there. So it could be in the form of a video or infographic or just a graphic. And so that's the beauty of content marketing, really putting yourself out there um, and depending on the platform, putting yourself out there with various types of content. So for example, if we look at YouTube, you can see this video here about digital marketing certified associate. Well, hey, you don't need to always write the content. You can produce the content in the form of a video and post it on YouTube. This is a form of content marketing. So that's content marketing. And then let's talk about mobile marketing. So content marketing, again, different types. But if we go now to mobile marketing, you can kind of segue from content to mobile because the only difference here is with mobile, it's strictly on mobile phone. It's not desktop. So mobile marketing is really a strategy on its own that helps you, the company, promoting your product or service to reach your target audience through a mobile device. And that includes tablets. And how you could do that is via messaging. You could do it via email or you could be do it via an app. Okay, so you have different ways of getting your content out there to people. Okay, so as an example, you can use basically SMS or instant messaging via mobile devices to promote your product or service. Here's another example of a mobile marketing via app install. And so you can even compound that by running a, say, Google ad as an example, and running your Google ad on, say, just mobile. You could do a bit adjustment just for mobile, and the goal could be app installs. Okay, so, and you can even do a mobile or app extension. 
So there's lots of ways to really promote your app or your product or your service via mobile marketing. Okay, let's talk about the customer life cycle. So we know why we want to do digital marketing. We want to know, we want, we know what the digital marketing channels are because we just talked about them from SEO to social to affiliate to mobile to content to SEM. Okay, you have a lot of different digital marketing channels at your disposal. So now how do we go ahead and approach our customers? So that's what we're going to talk about first. So we're going to talk about different stages of the customer life cycle. Okay, and the first one is the awareness stage. So we need to get our customers aware of what we're selling or what we're promoting. Okay, so the awareness stage is really what product does your brand offer? That's a question we want to get out there and we want to answer. Okay, what does a customer need your product? Or excuse me, why does a customer need your product? That's a question we want to answer with digital marketing. Okay, what solution does your product provide? Okay, that's an answer to a question we want to make sure people understand. So these are questions that we want to be able to answer in the form of digital marketing, whether that be mobile or content. Okay, so getting our information out there that answers these essential questions. And if we could do that, then somebody's going to become aware of our product or service. Okay, so what product does our brand offer? Why does a customer need it? And what solution does it provide? Okay, those are some key questions that people tend to ask themselves when they look at a brand. Okay, and when they look at a product, hey, do I really need this? Is it going to help me in my life? Okay, and who, who is selling this? I mean, who is this brand? I mean, that's those are just things that run through people's mind intuitively that with the right messaging, the right channel, the right type of asset, the right targeted audience, you can quickly make somebody aware of your brand's product or service. In this stage, it's help potential customers discover your brand with the help of these different marketing channels. So in the awareness stage, you know, content is key. So it's to me, if we have a website, we need a blog because if somebody does come to our blog from say organic search, SEO, then we can write about that product or service via blog and, and talk to our customer, talk directly to our targeted audience through that blog. And if we're not ranking organically, we can use paid search to promote it because paid search on Google, for example, Basically, we can be right at the top of the search results. And so somebody can actually see it when they do a search because we know millions of people you search on a daily basis. You could do social media marketing, okay? So you can publish that product or service on Facebook while you're building your community. And you can use affiliate marketing to help get the word out by using CJ.com as an example. Build up a sales force of people these publishers that are gonna put your product or service out there. So to me, in the awareness stage, these are the, the digital marketing channels you could focus on. Now I will say one thing about display ads. Display is part of search engine marketing. You could use display because you can reach a large number of people. So even though it's listed here low priority, in the awareness stage, display ads mean that if you go on Google's display network, you could pick and choose your sites, your demographics, keywords, topics, and audience. You could focus on all those different demographics to really attract a large number of people. So low priority, but it's probably also good to focus on in the awareness stage. Okay, so content marketing, you must create a high quality content that people are searching for. Without content, it's hard to get found. And so to me, this is you know where the blog comes in, SEO, Take that content, get it optimized. Okay, SEM, if we're not ranking organically, we can make sure we're at the top of the paid search results or the, the, the search results for a particular keyword we want to be found for. And then social media marketing, using different channels depending on the channel. If we're selling, you know, training like Simply Learn does, you know, LinkedIn is a good platform for us. Okay, and then affiliate you know, basically building up a nice network of publishers to get the word out. So these are all good channels that we can focus in on. So traffic sources may include paid, unpaid, social, referral, display, email, or direct. So they, they, they could come in the awareness stage from all different types of channels. Even though you're focused on content, I mean, you could still get 
traffic from mobile or email. So now that we got the word out via all these different marketing channels, there's that consideration stage. So, you know, people are aware of us, now they're considering us. And that's kind of the next stage in the process. Okay, so a few essential questions to address on the consideration stage. Hey, what features make your product valuable to others? And how will I increase customer engagement towards my product? So those are answers to questions you wanna ask, okay? What features make your product valuable? You wanna basically separate yourself from the competition. Basically, that's what you're trying to answer, okay? So if you're promoting your product or service on paid search and other people are bidding on the same keyword, how are you gonna stand out? And then how will I increase customer engagement towards my product? So in, for example, if you're on Facebook, okay, and you're trying to get people over to your site to purchase your product, then how are you going to improve that engagement? You gotta create something really snazzy or really it's gonna be attention grabbing or something that's gonna get them to become aware of it, that's gonna separate your post from all the other posts that are in somebody's Facebook newsfeed. Okay, so you really have to work hard to really convince somebody to get their consideration towards your product or service. So in this stage, your customer considers your product, so help them understand how your product is valuable. Okay, to me, email works really good here because if you have a targeted audience, this gives you the opportunity to really answer these questions in that particular channel. Email, you could support that with a promotion. And display, I think display is a good option here too because even though you know people are trying to become aware, you know, you can really hone in and really get them to take that next step. Okay, with display, you can even do remarketing. So if somebody's been to your site because they're aware of your product, they're curious, you can cookie them and remarket to them via display. So display to me is a good, a good channel to use here. Okay, so you have email, mobile display, you know, SEM, these are all you know, good channels to use on the consideration stage, especially on search, because if somebody's looking for something and they're aware of your brand, then you have the good opportunity to get them to click on your ad, especially if you're offering a promotion and get them to convert. The goal here is to increase our engagement. So people are aware we're moving them further along the funnel. With email marketing, we have the opportunity to promote the product, by sending an email directly to our audience. So with this stage, plan your campaigns around welcoming emails, newsletters. We can talk about product descriptions, add ratings and reviews in the email. You know, we really just wanna encourage people to purchase the product. That's, we're trying to sway them over. So email is a good source to allow us to do that. So with mobile marketing, we can promote the products by sending relevant messages to our target audience. Display, again, retargeting, because we can retarget an audience that has been to our website, already did some research about our brand, our product or service, and now we're going to reach back out to them to sway them. So remember, we wanna encourage customers to buy a product by creating detailed articles about the product. That always helps, and that's content, okay? We wanna opt for a customer testimonial, okay? That helps sway people, and add some guest blogging. Okay, we can have ambassadors blog on our behalf or we can go out and blog on somebody else's site. Okay, so blogging works both ways. It's ways of, of showing yourself and telling people, hey, we know you're looking for this product. Here's why you wanna choose us. Okay, moving on from the consideration to the purchase stage. So they're aware of you, they're considering you, and now we're on to the purchase stage. So the questions we wanna really make sure we address here are, how are my prices compared to my competitors? And is my brand more credible than others? Okay, so they're considering you, but that price point, and it may not even be the price, it could be the shipping, for example. The price could be good, but the shipping cost could be high. So you really wanna do some due diligence and research on what your competitors are doing. Credibility, that goes back to the consideration stage and testimonials. You wanna make sure you have reviews and testimonials to really elevate what you're trying to tell customers and that that is, hey, I have a good brand, I have a good product, I have a good service, come buy my stuff, come buy my product and service. But you really need to support that claim, you just can't go out and say it. 
And so supporting that comes in the form of what other people say. And that could be reviews. That could be comments on a social media platform. It could be, you know, stars on say Yelp or Google My Business. You know, make sure you do your due diligence and make sure you get people to, you know, review you or provide testimonials because people are going to do their due diligence before they purchase, especially if it's on Google My Business or Yelp or TripAdvisor or whatever it is you're trying to sell, they're going to be able to see those reviews. And so do your due diligence to get the reviews. And if it is a negative review, hey, that's okay. You can't please everyone. You're going to get them. That's the world we live in. Just make sure you show your upper hand and respond even to the negative as well as the positive reviews that you get. That actually bodes well to some people because, hey, it shows that I made a mistake and you're willing to correct it. And so people actually see that, that could be the tipping point to getting them to purchase. Say, look, hey, this brand really cares because they're really responding to people. They're not ignoring negativity. Okay, just those small things that can get people to change their mind. Now with the purchase stage, according to eConsultancy, 83% of the online audience require encouragement to complete a purchase. Encouragement, what does that mean? Well, it could mean providing a promo, giving them that extra incentive. You know, if you don't offer a promo, consider it, especially on the email. In the example we looked at earlier, sending out an email means that if the promo is going to end at midnight, send that email out and tell people they have until midnight. And if they purchase today, you'll leave it increase it to 20%. And email is a good channel for that. Mobile can reach a lot of people through SMS. Okay, social media, reaching people instantaneously. And then, you know, really with the purchase stage, it gives pro prospects an offer to help them make that purchase. So you have plenty of channels to choose from. In fact, most of these channels, the only one really that doesn't fit the instantaneous mode is SEO. But you can really focus on affiliate, even though that's a low priority here, you can really you know, coordinate with your publishers, who especially those publishers that have proven their worth and have sold your products in the past, you know, get them to help promote it and incentivize their audience. So let's move on from the purchase to the post purchase stage. So this is after somebody purchases. Okay, so some essential questions we want to be able to address here. So what additional product could my customer buy? Now that they're my customer, what else could I sell them? What, you know, without being too pushy, could if they buy a coat, well, a hat work or a pair of gloves or, you know, a blouse. You know, you want to be able to, you know, push a product on your customer, but think about how you can complement that purchases, that purchasers or customers product. And then how to improve the customer buying experience. So again, this goes back to, you know, what we just said about reviews, get somebody to offer a review. And if they don't give you a full complement of five stars, they only give you three and a half stars, then you know what? That's great feedback because then you can learn from that. And then the other question is, will the customer refer us to others? And if so, why? So that's definitely something you want to be able to address in the post-purchase stage. So let's take a look here. So with post-purchasing stage, you know, to me, emails at the top of this list because if somebody purchases something, you could send a nice thank you email because if they purchase, they're giving you their email in return because you're likely going to be sending them the receipt via email. So email to me is a nice channel you can send in a nice message even you know social media you know you can thank your community for supporting you on this recent campaign that you ran you know even throw in an extra five or ten percent on a future purchase as a thank you and that's easily done on social media you know you could even post a blog you know promoting you know the success of a product and then offering a promotion. Okay, so there's a lot of things you could be doing here on the post-purchasing stage. So to me, even looking at content again, you could even you know put a survey together. You could even put a survey together for your affiliates. Okay, you could even post a poll on Facebook. So it's just working in with these different channels to get some feedback about your product and service. So with email, mobile, you can engage customers with follow-up emails or customer care content. 
you know, with mobile, if you have somebody's mobile number, hey, text them. A simple thank you goes a long way. You know, you could say, hey, look, if you're satisfied, let us know, give us a call. You can even, in the EE mobile text message, you can put a link to a survey. Send emails to active subscribers, give rewards for customer feedback. So if somebody does provide feedback, give them an extra 10% off. You know, you wanna be able to reward loyalty. Loyalty comes in the form of a partnership. If you're giving somebody discounts and you have a good product or service, then they're gonna recognize that. They're gonna say, hey, look, I really like this product and they're giving me 10%, I'm gonna go ahead and purchase from these guys again. So give those discounts to those active customers or on the affiliate network, give referral opportunities to your customers. So if it's an affiliate publisher, hey, if they're getting people to your site, you know, reward them. Or if it's an email and you put a four to a friend, get an extra 10% off, it doesn't hurt because you're incentivizing people to help you sell your product. So with social display and content, use those banner ads or use that content that you display on social or the blog you're gonna write to give customers advice in order to maximize the value of the purchase. So again, you can use these platforms to also enhance uh, what they purchased. So, hey, you just purchased this product. Thank you very much. Did you know you could do this, this, and this with it? And so that's the idea of a post-purchase stage, is to maximize these channels to be able to answer those essential questions about what else could they purchase? You know, do they like, how do I be get these people to become loyal customers? Okay, so with the first purchase stage, if a customer has bought a pair of sports shoes, for example, running shoes, you can recommend a cross product sale, a cross sale. It could be a pair of shorts or a water bottle or an accessory with an exclusive discount. So that's another example of what you can do on the post-purchase stage. Greetings, everyone. This is Rob Sanders with Simply Learn. Thank you for joining. And today we're going to cover digital marketing interview questions and answers. So thanks for joining again. And here's how it's gonna work. So we broke out a few questions and answers uh, in different categories. A lot of you are going to be interviewing for some jobs out there and some of the jobs may be an SEO manager or, or search engine marketing manager or email marketing manager or content marketing manager or social media manager. So we broke up those questions into those areas. And so that's what we're gonna do. We're gonna start with SEO. We're gonna go through some questions and I'm gonna explain the answers to those questions. So if you have any questions to these questions or answers, feel free to just comment right below this video and we'll get back to you as soon as possible. So let's get started. And we're gonna start with SEO, search engine optimization. We're gonna go through a series of questions and I'm gonna answer those questions for you. Okay, so the first question that you might be asking in an interview is differentiate between do follows and no follows. Okay, so if you take in or listen to my SEO courses on YouTube for SEO, we, we talked a lot about do follows and no follows. And, and simply put, I mean, do follows are just signals to the search engines to follow the link. So there's a link on site A pointing to site B. We're gonna basically tell Google, Bing, and some of these other search engines, hey, go ahead and follow that link. Now, a nofollow is just the opposite. So a nofollow link doesn't allow the search engine crawlers to follow it. So if we have a link on our site, site A pointing to site B, we could put a nofollow tag in there. And what that's gonna do, it's going to signal to the crawlers, hey, don't follow this link. So in the end, if the crawlers don't follow the link, then there's not gonna be any link juice passed. And so Google is not gonna give you credit or give that site credit for having a link pointing to it or pointing to another site or from another site. And so it's all about linking. So we can control if there's links on our site, whether we want the crawlers to recognize those or not simply with no follow tags. So, just a reminder, link juice is the reputation or equity passed from one website to another. So if you have a link on another website and that website is of high quality, meaning their page authority, their domain authority is high, they have a lot of content, you know, they're not spammy, they're really rich and they're relevant, then you may want to make sure that the link pointing from that site to your site 
is a nofollow. So that way that Google can recognize the link from that site to your site. And basically that reputation is going to be passed on to you. Okay, so that's a do follow versus a no follow. And why would we do a no follow? Well, it just depends. Um, it really depends. A lot of social media platforms like Facebook have no follows. If you have a lot of content, you may not want to be pushing out a lot of do follows. It could actually look bad from an external linking standpoint. And so a lot of sites are really particular about who they want to pass link juice onto and give credit for the link. So it's a business decision at the end of the day. There's really no hard, fast rule here, except from an SEO perspective, if I have a site and I have a lot of external links pointing outward to other sites, I'm going to be particular about who I allow the search engine to follow and what links I allow not to follow. Okay. So here's an example of what they look like. So do follow is simply just the href. Notice the no follow has the the tag appended to it, the href tag with a no follow. So if the search engine's crawling your site and they see that no follow there, they're not gonna follow that link and vice versa. If there's a link on another site pointing to yours and there's a no follow there, you're not gonna get credit. The search engines aren't gonna pick up that link. Okay, so question two, what is 301 redirect and how is it different from a 302 redirect? So. 301 redirects tell users in the search engine specifically that an original page has been moved, and this is the keyword here, permanently. So permanently moved. We're gonna explain that in a minute. So it's just moved from one page to another. And so if we don't have a page anymore, but we have a new page, let's just say you built a new website with new URLs, you wanna make sure the old page is pointing to the new page with a 301 redirect. So if a 301 redirect is permanent, then a 302 is temporary. So we want the search engines to recognize that we have 301 permanent redirects in place. Why? Because if we have temporary, then it might alert Google to not keep that page in its search engine rankings because it's temporary. So why would Google want to keep a temporary page or even a page that is pointing to another page on a temporary basis? So they re may remove both pages from its index. Okay, but if we have something permanent in place, Google may say, okay, this page is permanently linking to another page or redirecting to another page. Therefore, it's stable, it's permanent, we're gonna keep that new page in the index and eventually remove the old page. So really something permanent is more stable in the eyes of the search engine. Something temporary may not be as stable in the eyes of say Google. And if they don't see it as stable, then they may remove both pages from the index. Okay, so the idea is we want to be found in Google search index and we get it. Sometimes pages go away for a variety of reasons. And if it does go away, just make sure you have a new page for it. And that new page is a 301 permanent redirect. Okay, so question three, why are backlinks important in SEO? Well, we kind of hinted on that a bit with the nofollow, because if we have a link from another website pointing to ours, and that link from that other website is really relevant, and, and it has a high page and domain authority, then it's gonna benefit us. And so backlinks are important because if we have backlinks from high quality sites, it's going to improve the credibility of our site, especially if it's a do follow tag. So the search engines are going to recognize the relationship between the site that has a link pointing to us. Okay, so it's just going to build our credibility. It's going to increase, increase our domain authority. And then the net effect of that is if we're credible and we have high domain authority, then that's going to increase the rankings of our pages. And when the pages increase in ranking, then we're going to get a more of a lion's share of the traffic for certain keywords that our pages are found for. And if our pages are found and getting traffic, then because we have increased rankings, we're likely gonna have increased traffic. And then it's just a snowball effect. So more traffic leads to more engagement and conversions. So the whole idea for SEO is remember, you have an on-page, strategy and an off-page strategy. Building external links is part of an off-page SEO strategy. And we wanna make sure that you know we are relevant in the form of a link or in the form of content on other high quality sites. Being on a high quality site only benefits us because again, increases our domain authority. Google sees us as more relevant. Therefore, our pages are gonna benefit by ranking higher. 
and therefore when we rank higher we get more traffic so it's a snowball effect so having backlinks is important because it snowballs all the way through to conversions okay so what are the best practices to rank your videos on youtube so this is a great question really great question given the importance of videos especially with seo because videos are found youtube in itself is a search engine so if we have a video how are we going to get it to rank on youtube well first things first you never want to put a video out there and want it to rank if it's not engaging or informative so make sure you go ahead and follow the best practices of having engaging and informative content in your video now once you have that video in place you want to optimize it and then some of the key factors for optimizing the video are you want to choose a title that has high search volume and low difficulty just as you would keyword for example for a web page you want to choose a title with a keyword in it that has high volume and low difficulty i.e low competition okay so you want a nice ratio there and you know what well, you want to choose a title that's going to get people to watch the video too so it's not all about just choosing a title just for the sake of high volume you also have to choose something that's relevant that's going to be catchy as well and then with that title goes the description so you want a description that's very relevant to your title okay because most people aren't going to click on a video just for the sake of a title they're going to want to probably get a sneak peek via the description of what it is so again you want to optimize that description but make sure the description is, is just as snazzy as the title okay you also want to use accurate and relevant video tags just as you would on twitter or facebook tag these videos okay so make sure your title tag length doesn't exceed 100 characters because it will get chopped off so again that goes back to just writing something really short and to the point that's going to grab somebody's attention okay you also want to upload a captivating thumbnail something that's relevant then that's going to grab somebody's attention and then again we set it similar to the video tags we want to use relevant hashtags again just as you would with twitter and facebook go ahead and throw some hashtags in there that people could see because people search via hashtagging and then this goes without saying you did all the work created a really great video it's engaging it's informative you optimized it feel free to promote your video on other social media platforms Okay, don't just stick with YouTube per se. So the benefit here is if you post it on Facebook or LinkedIn or whatever platform of your choice and it gets engagement, people click on the link, go to YouTube, they're gonna like it and then other people are gonna see that engagement. They're gonna see how many people liked it or how many subscribers you have. So promote your videos to help you with the ranking of the video on YouTube. So that does play into it. So go ahead and promote it so other people can watch it, like it, comment, etc. And that's going to engage other people to want to do the same. So what is mobile first indexing? This is a really important and timely question. Mobile first indexing means Google's just using mobile friendly content for indexing and ranking websites. So in other words, Google, for example, has two bots. They have the traditional desktop bot and they have a smartphone bot. And eventually everybody that has a website is gonna be migrated over to the smartphone bot. And so if that smartphone bot goes to your website and starts crawling, what do you think they're looking for? Their smartphone bot, they're looking for mobile friendly content. If it's not mobile friendly, meaning the page isn't designed for a smartphone browser, or let's just say the images are way too large, or you have to expand the text just to read it, you know, a lot of these these issues that somebody would have just simply trying to read something on a web page on their mobile device, Google's not going to grab that content. So you want to make sure it's mobile friendly so it gets indexed. And so if your website has a responsive design, Google will rank your website based on its performance on mobile devices. Okay, so you want to make sure that your website is mobile friendly. And if you're in an interview and somebody asks you this question, you could even take it a step further and say, look, I'm going to measure how friendly my, my website is for mobile devices in Google Search Console. Because Google Search Console has a report that will show you what pages on your website are not mobile friendly. And it's not a guarantee, but I could tell you if I'm Google and I'm crawling your site with my smartphone bot, and that page or one of my pages is not mobile friendly 
I'm probably not going to index it or rank it. So you want to leverage that report in Google Search Console to see what pages are mobile friendly. So that's a little bonus for you to really impress the interviewer who asked you this question. Because how are you going to know if one of your pages is mobile friendly or not if you don't look at a report? So keep an eye on Google Search Console's mobile usability report. Okay, number six. List down the most important local SEO ranking factors. Okay, so organic local ranking is just as important as anything else in organic search. Because if you have a local business, you want to use the likes of, say, Google My Business to show up when somebody types in, you know, looking for a florist or you're looking for a coffee shop. So what you want to do is you want to create a web page for every product and service. Okay. You also want to opt for your business listings on Google My Business. And, and there are plenty of other local business directories out there like Yelp, for example, or Bing even has one. So go ahead and also make sure you have a business listing as well. But since Google in the United States has a huge market share, you want to start with Google first. You want to update your NAP citations on your website, maintain consistency of your NAP. Okay, so NAP is name, address, phone number. So you want to make sure that that's current and consistent. So if you have a number on your website, make sure it's the same number on Google My Business. Okay, you can embed a Google map on your website. You could certainly optimize the meta tags and content, not only on your web pages, but within your Google My Business directory. So you can add your business to other local directories, like I mentioned, Yelp. And then also just as important, opt for reviews and ratings. Okay, so the more reviews the hat you have, the better off you are. Okay, so I always say this with, the, uh, with local search. Three of the main factors in showing up for local search on, say, Google is obviously the keyword. The second is the proximity of where that person is. And then third is the reviews. So you can't really control the proximity, but you can control the keyword and you can control the reviews to some degree. So work hard at getting reviews for your business, but at the same time, you can certainly work in some keywords, let's just say for your product and service pages on your website, but also you can translate that over to Google My Business. Okay? So working in those keywords, making sure your, your number, your address, your name, they're all consistent. And, and really just spreading your, the, the business out on other directories. That's really, all these are really key factors for local SEO. Okay, so question number seven, how to avoid duplicate content, getting penalized for duplicate content. So for example, if you have two different versions of a web page, you may result in a duplicate content issue. So it's just SEO 101. You never wanna have two, two or more pages with the same content. So what do we do? Well, we can avoid this in having Google penalize us by, again, setting up a 301 redirect. Remember, 301s are permanent. We can also use what they call a canonical tag. And a canonical tag basically alerts the search engines as to which page is the original. Okay, so if we have an original page, we want to point to that page with our canonical tag. And then the third option is opt for preferred domain in Google Search Console. Okay, so if you have multiple known names, make sure you set up a primary one in Search Console. So those are ways to work around it. Of this three, I would always go with the canonical tags because that's just a tag that's going to sit on the page. It's going to alert Google as to what the original is just in case they get their hands on the duplicate. So all the pages that have the same content are going to have the same canonical tag pointing to one page. So again, three ones are permanent. You could simply just redirect one to the other if you end up having duplication. Or you could just tell the search engines, hey, this is the original page. Or you can go through Search Console. Okay, number eight, what are the tactics to increase a web page speed? Okay, so what are some of the tactics? Well, when you build a site, especially for mobile, you want to keep it as simple as possible. I mean, what I mean by simple as possible, really, I mean, hey, use a simple website design. Don't get overly creative, if you will. Most websites, all websites have images. You're not going to be able to get around that, but just make sure you optimize your images. In other words, don't have such a large image size. If you don't need something very large, don't have it. Okay, you want to improve server response time. And what do we mean by that? Well, your site's sitting on a server somewhere. 
You can own that server or you can be renting it out from say Amazon Web Services or let's just say GoDaddy as your register. They also have web hosting. Well, if you have it on say GoDaddy server, you may be sharing that server with other businesses. And at certain times of the day, other businesses may get a lot of traffic and suck up a lot of bandwidth. What is that gonna do? That's going to reduce the server response time for your site. And so you want to make sure you have a, an idea of, you know, what server your web page or website is on. And you want to be able to can have some control over that. Because if your server response is slow, that's going to slow down everything else in terms of loading in the browser. And that's not going to be good for SEO. Okay, optimize your code. We mean by optimize, minimifying. When we say minimifying, we mean get rid of some of the redundant code. If you have CSS, you know, get rid of, chop some of the, get rid of the JavaScript you're not using. So that's what we mean by optimizing code. Reduce redirects. Okay, ideally you just want to have one redirect in place. You don't want to create a, a daisy chain, so to speak, of redirecting and redirecting after that. That's never going to bode well and it's going to slow things down as well. Enable browser caching. So if you enable browser caching, basically if somebody comes back to the page they've been on, say, two days ago, they're probably going to see a cache version of that page. And then opt for the content delivery network as well. So these are some of the ways to reduce page speed. Now, if you're curious about the page speed of your website, you can always go to Google's PageSpeed Insights tool. And all you have to do is just Google PageSpeed Insights or even just something generic like Google PageSpeed. And you're gonna get this tool, PageSpeed Insights. And all you need to do is just plug in a URL. When you plug in the URL, Google is going to analyze the URL for both mobile and desktop. And so here we could see Google gives a score. So we could see the score for mobile and we could see the score for desktop just by clicking on desktop. And so here I could see some of the issues that the site may be having in terms of page load time for their desktop. If I flip over to mobile, you know, here I could see some other issues. For example, they have a server static assets with efficient cache policy. Now, if you're not sure what the heck that means, you can always just click on it and you can see some specifics here and you know, or you can just always Google it as well. Uh, here you got the reduce the impact of third party code. Okay, so that's another thing. Uh, reduce JavaScript execution time. So again, going back to a lot of some of the comments we made about coding. Okay, so sometimes too much code or code not functioning as well as it should will tend to slow down the site. Okay, so you can use PageSpeed Insights. You can always get a glimpse of how pages are loading simply by also going to, for example, Google Analytics. Under behavior, okay, you can go to site speed and if you click on overview, okay, Google, what Google does is they do a sampling of pages over time. And in this case, based on 89 page views, they have an average page load time. And so you can get a sense of how quick specific pages load or your site overall simply by looking at the site speed overview report in Google Analytics to get a sense of how quick your pages are loading. Now, there are certain factors that do affect load time. So obviously the way the page is built with the code, the images, etc., but also the browser, each browser loads differently. Okay. So you want to take a look at it by browser, also by country. Every country has a different network. You can be in the United States and have worse network service than you do say in, you know, coast, uh, Ivory Coast in Africa. Okay. So it really depends on the network you're on. So, and also the page, every page is built differently. So you want to get a sense of what pages are loading quicker and which pages are not. You can simply just go to page timings in Google Analytics and you get a sense of what pages do not load fast and which ones do. And maybe hone in on the pages that aren't loading fast and address those pages first. Okay, so you have two tools at your disposal, one Google Analytics and one PageSpeed Insights. Okay, so let's look at question number nine here so when should an individual target short tail and long tail keywords okay so remember short tail are usually one to two keywords very broad in nature long tail keywords are maybe three four keywords in a query or maybe an entire sentence those are considered long tail keywords 
So usually short tail keywords have higher volume, but also higher competition. Longer tail keywords usually have lower uh, volume, but also lower competition. But the great thing about long tail keywords, the conversion rate will tend to be a little bit higher than say a short tail because it's less vague and more specific. So you can use short tail keywords if you're trying to drive a lot of visitors because those keywords are gonna be vague or broad in nature. Long tail keywords are used for targeted pages such as product pages and articles. So if you have a specific product with a long name, you can certainly optimize that page for that product name Again, the product name may have low volume, but if somebody types in exactly that product name, you show up, the chance of you them converting are gonna be very high. So you don't have to always be that specific with the product name, but try and be as specific as you possibly can in order to get somebody to click on your link in the search engine results and get them over to your site to, to convert. Okay, so those are really the big differences. Short tail, very broad, very vague, a lot of volume, but also a lot of competition. But hey, if you're ranking for short tail keyword, you're probably going to get a lot of traffic. The conversion rates may not be as high as something, say, long tail, where, hey, maybe you're just honed in on a few set number of products and you're not care, you don't care a lot about the traffic. You just care about getting the relevant traffic to your site to convert. Okay, number 10, what are the important elements to focus while developing a website? So we're talking in terms of SEO, okay? So if somebody asks me this question in an interview, what am I gonna focus on while developing a website? Well, the answers are right here. Yes, we talked about mobile. Mobile is so important because a lot of websites are going to be indexed with Google Smartphone Bot. So mobile usability is very important. So we need to make sure our website is responsive for mobile. Just some basic practices when it comes to site architecture and navigation. We want to have a simple URL structure, okay? No overly cumbersome. The navigation should simply be clean and neat, okay? If you have five products, okay, maybe you have uh, in your navigation, you have something called products with all five listed or you have all five products in the main navigation. The key is you just want to make it clean and neat and easy for somebody to find. The, the rule of thumb is if it's good for the end user, probably going to be good for Google. But if complicated for the end user, it's probably going to be complicated for Google. Okay, you always want to create a sitemap. Now, what is that sitemap? A sitemap is simply just a formatted file with to, that includes all your URLs and assets, your images and your videos. They're going to be sitting on your server as well. So you want Google or these, these bots to be able to find your pages and assets. And by the way, you want to take it a step further and make sure you upload that sitemap, which is sitting in the root directory, meaning domain.com slash sitemap.xml. Okay, you want to take that sitemap and make sure you input that sitemap location in Google Search Console. That way, Google Search Console has a one-way ticket to grab the elements in the sitemap. Another important element to focus on while developing a website is having a robots text file. And all a robots text file is, it's like a lock, I always say, to a house. So if you lock a door in your house, nobody's gonna be able to get in that door. So that's all a robots text file is. You're telling Google and these other bots that are coming to crawl your site, what's locked and what's not locked, meaning, what they have access to, and what they don't have access to. So you wanna be able to make sure you have a robots text file if you're trying to not index specific pages of your website. Because if you tell Google, don't crawl these pages or this directory, they're not gonna get crawled. And if they don't get crawled, they're not gonna get indexed. So robots text file is an important element to focus on while you're developing your website. And while you're developing your website, it could be on a, you know, in a directory just called new website, so you probably want to have new website as the directory in the robots text file and just to let Google know, don't go into this directory because it's my new website. And I'm not ready to go live yet. So you don't want it indexed. So there are a lot of reasons to have robots text files. That's the main reason. Sitemap, you want Google to get these pages and assets quickly. Okay, you want to make sure that your site architecture navigation is in order. You want to make sure your site is mobile friendly. And you also want to make sure you have content on your website. That's the key because that's what's going to keep people on the website and engaged. And when I say content, I don't necessarily just mean words. I also mean videos. 
I also mean images, you know, something interactive. Okay, you want to keep people engaged. That's the key behind it. Trust me, if, if an end user finds your site engaging, Google is likely going to find your site engaging. Okay, so those are good brownie points to bring up if somebody asks you this question in an interview. So just a quick cap here, it's important to have a better site structure so the bots can easily access and mix the content. Okay, with a responsive design, helps to make your website mobile friendly and user friendly. Would also increase the amount of time a user spends on your website, which may improve your site's ranking. Sitemap is simply just a file that helps search engine bots to understand the structure of the website. Okay, how many pages are on your website and where are they located, along with the videos and images. Okay, and then the robots text just instructs the search engine crawlers to understand what pages should not be indexed. Okay, this is simply just a text file and it's added to the root directory. Again, think like a door, think of a lock. Okay, you can tell, you can lock whatever doors you want in your house. Then give it that way. Okay, so those are our questions for SEO. Again, if you have any additional questions or if there are other questions maybe you've been asked in an SEO interview, then go ahead and add them to the comment section below. We'd love to hear from you. Now we're going to turn our attention to search engine marketing. So let's turn our full attention to search engine marketing. Uh, so we're moving away from SEO and over to pay-per-click. And so you really have to know your stuff here. You really do. Uh, so a lot of the questions we're going to ask are going to be centered around Google Ads, formerly known as Google Ads Words. And so if you're familiar with Google Ads, the platform, then you should have no problems whatsoever answering these questions. But that's why we're here and that's why you're watching. So if there's anything you want to add to any of these questions, as a reminder, feel free to comment under the video. And so right out of the gate, question 11, what is ad scheduling? So ad scheduling is a feature in Google Ads. And really all it does is allow you, the advertiser, to set up certain hours or days you want your ads to show. It's as simple as that. So if you have a customer that you're running ads for on Google Search, and let's just say they have a restaurant, and they're closed during certain hours of the week, then you can go into the ad scheduler and schedule your ads to not show when they're closed, as an example, okay? Because if somebody calls and they're not there to answer the phone, then it's not gonna be good for the restaurant or you, the advertiser. And so that's why they have the ad scheduling. So it ensures your ads are not running when they're performing poorly. Let's just say, you know, you're running a business and you just don't get that much traffic during the weekends. Well, you can go in and adjust accordingly. It also is there to make sure you can serve your customers when you do have limited client service hours. So let's just say you have a customer service team that's going to answer phones for a couple hours a day. Well, again, you can schedule your ads to show during those couple of hours a day. And then really what it comes down to is you're making sure you can satisfy customer demand and supply. And so that means showing your ads when you, you can best fulfill the customer's needs. Okay. And so that's really what it's all about. Uh, and that's what ad scheduling is. So take advantage of ad scheduling. Schedule it according to the business hours. Schedule according to how they can best serve the customer. Schedule the ads when it's performing best. And don't schedule the ads when you know you're going to have poor performance. Okay, so next question, what are the different ad formats available on Google Ads? It's a trick question because it really does come down to what network you're advertising on. So Google has two networks, the search network and the display network. Okay, so on the search network, there's only one ad format and that's text. Okay, so Google recently changed the format of the text ads now they're called expanded text ads so here you can see you can have up to three headlines and two description lines and then you can also have ad extensions and so you can see here underneath the ad you have what they call site links so shop by category in here headphones on ear headphones those are all site links to specific pages on the site so text ads are available only on the search network, but they're also available on the display network as well. Then you have responsive display ads. Now, responsive, responsive display ads are only on Google's display network. Okay, so here you could see some samples of responsive display ads. 
And these ads adjust their size and format depending on the space available. So again, you could have text ads or you can have display ads. Now display ads again come in different sizes. So you can create ads you know, for a variety of different sizes. For example, 250 by 250 or 468 by 60. So those are some of the different ad types. There's, there's an, a plethora of different ad sizes you can choose. However, your ad's not gonna show on a website if they don't have that particular size available. So it's always best practice to create different ads, but create ads in different sizes as well. Okay, and then have a backup text ad as well, just in case the site doesn't even display a display ad for you or serve up a display ad. So you can have a text ad as a backup. Okay, so lots of different ad sizes, but this is the second ad format, and that's responsive display. And again, the responsive part is Google will automatically show the ad that's best performing based on a series of headlines, descriptions, and images that you, you provide Google. And so the responsive part is, hey, if this combination of headline, description, and image work best, meaning it has the best click-through rate, then Google's gonna serve up that ad. So that's why they call it responsive. So obviously you can have just an image ad that's not responsive. Again, across different ad sizes, you know, they could be, again, 250 by 250, 300 by 300, 468 by 60. There's a number of different sizes. Google can provide you that information. But the one thing to note here is that when you do create an image ad, it could be JPEG, it could be interactive or it could be static. So different types of image ad formats like PNG, for example, or it could be a static or it could be interactive. So definitely take advantage of the different opportunities, uh, meaning a static ad versus an interactive ad. You may wanna have two variations of that so you could see which one works best. Okay, there's also app promotion ads. So these ads are used to drive app downloads. So you're gonna have to set up a campaign accordingly, okay? But here you can see this is what it looks like with a call to action. So it allows you to go ahead and click and install that app. So that's an app promotion. Again, if you have an app and you wanna promote it, you can use this type of ad format to align with a campaign that's driving traffic to download your app. Okay, and of course you have video ads. Well, Google owns YouTube. And so if you have videos, you have the opportunity to advertise on YouTube. Okay, so these ads can be standalone or inserted into other streaming video content. And so to me, video ads work well with specific strategies. And what's one strategy you would use a video ad for? Brand awareness or education, explainer videos. And so YouTube allows you, the advertiser, the opportunity to get your ad, your service, your product in front of a lot of eyeballs. So that's the beauty of video ads. They attract a lot of eyeballs and definitely help with the strategy of say brand awareness. Okay, another ad format going back to the search network is shopping ads. So if you sell shoes, then you may want to think about having a campaign for shopping. So shopping ads work with Google Merchant. So Google Merchant is another Google product. And basically Google Merchant allows you to manage your inventory. So if you have a hundred different types of shoes that you're selling, you can upload your inventory to Google Merchant, connects and talks to Google Ads. So basically what you're doing, you're setting up your, your campaign in Google Ads and connecting your inventory from Google Merchant to Google Ads. And so the great thing about the shopping campaign is it puts your products front and center. It puts the price, it puts any promotion that you have, and it puts the brand all front and center. So when somebody does type in, let's just say lime green sneakers or women's sneakers, and this particular shoe shows up here, the third one from the left, then somebody's gonna see it's from the United Colors of Benetton. It's a woman's shoe. It's on Amazon and it costs $45. So the great thing about shopping ads is if somebody's interested, they're gonna click. Okay, if somebody's not interested, say, well, you know, it's a little bit more expensive. I can get something similar, another shoe on Amazon for less. 
okay, they're probably gonna click on that particular ad. So again, the great thing about shopping ads, put your product front and center with any promotion, the price, the brand. So if somebody clicks on it, then they're probably serious buyers. Okay, so that's the beauty of shopping ads. It allows you to get your product out there and on the search network, it's a cost per click. So you're only paying for the click. So if somebody looks at it, but doesn't click, you're not paying for that. So that's the beauty of shopping ads. And so you can showcase your shopping ads. So these ads have an image and a description that expand when clicked. So you can provide more information, more product and store information as well. You also have call only ads. Okay, so call only ads are enabled to users to connect with your business directly using the phone number provided. Okay, so it allows somebody on a mobile phone who in this example is searching for drywall repair. Well, if you're in the business of drywall repair, you can have your ad show up on mobile with the phone number and somebody can easily click on that phone number and just call you directly. Now the way call only ads work is you're still getting charged for the click. Okay, so anytime somebody clicks and calls, you're gonna get charged and you're gonna get charged just as you would if somebody clicked on your ad. So it works the same way. So it's a cost per click. Again, this is on search. So search is cost per click. And the beauty about call only is again, you can track the calls right in Google Ads. So you can have Google Ads track how many people click on the number and you can even count those calls as conversions if they meet a certain criteria. For example, the criteria is somebody talks to you for a minimum of 60 seconds or one minute then Google will count that as a conversion. So you can monitor calls right in Google Ads and it's a cost per click model so you can actually see what the average cost per click is. So moving on, question 13. Okay, what is RLSA and how does it work? Well, RLSA stands for Remarketing List for Search Ads. So if you're familiar with remarketing on display, it's similar. They just call it RLSA. Okay, so it enables you, the advertiser, to customize your ads for people who have visited your site, just like a typical remarketing campaign. Okay, so you can tailor your bids and ads to these visitors when they're searching on Google and search partner sites. Okay, so there are two basic strategies for using RLSA. Okay, so you can optimize bids for existing keywords for visitors, or you can bid on keywords that you don't normally bid on just for people who recently visited your site or converted on your site. The key here is you're the one that's picking the customer. You're the one that's enabling the list. If you're trying to target people who went to your site and didn't convert, well, you could certainly optimize your bids for existing keywords for people who went to your site and didn't convert, or you could set up a whole new campaign for RLSA and have a different set of keywords with a different ad because you know who you're talking to. You're talking to somebody who's already been to your site. They know your brand. They just didn't purchase. And so this all happens on the search network. And that's the beauty of remarketing is one, you know who your audience is because you're the one establishing that audience. And two, you're the one creating the ad. So you can talk directly to that audience when they see your ad again, in this case on search. So that's RLSA, Remarketing List for Search Ads. I recommend pretty much any industry, any client, any customer run Remarketing List for Search Advertising and Remarketing for Display. So those are two key campaigns you should always recommend running to a client because one, again, you're defining the audience. Two, you're the one that's talking directly to the audience because you know who the audience is. And three, if they see the ad, and they click on it, again, because it's cost per click, then the chances of them converting are gonna be higher because they've already been to your website, they know who you are. And so if they click on your ad again, then they must be interested. So those are all the benefits of running an RLSA campaign. Okay, so number 14, what types of audiences can be used in GDN, Google's display network? So a lot of different audiences here. Okay, so let's go through them so you have affinity audiences. So basically affinity audiences are basically what are people's interest and habits? What do they have an affinity for? Are there food sites, travel sites, shopping sites, fashion? Okay, so that's what affinity really relates to. Okay, then you have in market, custom intent, life events. These are what they're researching or planning for. So again, it could be travel, it can be finance, etc. 
Okay, you have remarketing. We just went over that with the remarketing list for search advertising, RLSA. And so we're with the remarketing, it's an audience that has interacted with your website. So they either came from mobile or came from mobile and didn't convert or female came from mobile and didn't convert. So you're the one defining the audience there. You also have a similar audience. So this is what Google creates on your behalf. So these are users with a similar interest to your site visitors. So Google is monitoring the type of traffic that's coming to your site. And based on that traffic, they're gonna create a similar audience. And then you have a custom match. So what you know about your customer's activities, basically. So these are all the different audience types and you can see the different types of ads available. Okay, so notice the far right column video ads. So video ads are available to every one of these audience types. Why? Because YouTube. So Google knows what people's interests and habits are based on the videos they watch. They know what they're looking for. Okay, they you know, know that they've been to your website because they're cooking, so you can remarket them. Okay, so video ads are a very powerful tool for any one of these audience types. So next question, what are the types of keyword matching available in Google Ads? Okay, so this is a good question. Very important, if you're gonna manage a Google Ads account and a campaign, you have to be aware of the different match types. You can't just go broad match. That's a sign of somebody who doesn't know what they're doing is by bidding on a one keyword phrase. That's a short tail keyword. If you think back to SEO, we have our long tail and our short tail keywords. The worst thing you could do is bid on a keyword, short tail keyword that's broad match. Because what is broad match? Basically, broad match are keywords that appear when a user searches any word in the phrase. Now, you can define specifically what you want your ads to appear for in terms of keywords. And when I say specifically, you can use a phrase match. So phrase match are ads that appear only when a user searches for that exact keyword phrase in the precise order, but with some additional words in the beginning or at the end of the query. Okay, so usually these are sentences. So you could be, you know, bidding on red Adidas running shoes. And somebody could type in looking for red Adidas running shoes in Portland, Oregon, okay, as an example. Okay, so as long as red Adidas running shoes are in order in that keyword phrase, then your ad's going to appear because it's a phrase match. And then you can get really specific by doing an exact match. So exact match are keywords that are triggered only when that keyword and exactly that keyword phrase is queried. So if you do an exact match for red Adidas running shoes and somebody types in only red Adidas running shoes, then that's an exact match and your ad's going to appear. So let's take a look at these again. So you got broad match, okay? We got a term cheap smartphone. So if somebody types in smartphone, cheap phone, smart mobile, phone cheap, any one of those combinations, your ad's going to appear. Now there's one thing you can do for broad match and it's called broad match modifier. So you could put a plus sign in front of the keyword. For example, let's just say you really want to emphasize the word cheap, okay? You're selling really inexpensive smartphones, okay? Not just any smartphone, but an inexpensive smartphone. So you can put a plus sign in front of cheap. And so if somebody puts in, you know, just smartphone or smart mobile, your ad's not going to show up because the word, the keyword query has to contain sheep. So anytime you put a plus in front of the keyword query you're bidding on, then that means that keyword has to be part of the keyword phrase. So that's a, a broad match modifier, if you will. And that prevents you from getting unwanted impressions. So we have phrase match, again, blue smartphone. So somebody could type in smartphone in blue color, cheap blue smartphone. Notice though, the second one where it says smartphone in blue color, your ad's not necessarily gonna show up because guess what? Blue smartphone is the keyword query and your, uh, your, the, the query here is not in that order. So remember, in order for you to show up for phrase match, the keyword has to be in that order. So I'm looking for a blue smartphone that is less than $100. Okay, that could be somebody's query. Blue smartphone was in that query in that order. So if somebody says looking for a smartphone that happens to be blue, less than $100, then your 
add is not going to show up. So remember, it has to be in that precise order. One thing I want us to go back to on the phrase match, notice that there's quotes around the keyword. Anytime you see quotes around the keyword, that signifies it's a phrase match. Because if we look at exact match, notice there are brackets around the keyword red shoe. That signifies it's an exact match. So if you put brackets around a keyword, then you're signify signaling to Google that this is an exact match and I only want to show up for the keyword red shoe. Well, the only option that will work here is the second one, red shoes. Okay, so because that's an exact match. Okay, so disregard the first and the third one because shoe and red color is not going to work and footwear that's red is not going to work because this is an exact match. So you're saying I only want to show up for the keyword red shoe. And Google recognizes plurals and singulars together. So if somebody did type in red shoes then your ad is going to show up. Okay, so moving on, what are some of the reasons as to why your ads could have been rejected? It happens to the best of us. And if you're writing ads and they get rejected, it could be for a number of reasons. So at the end of the day, you're violating Google's advertising policies. So some of the policies that could have been violated are, and just some of the many, we're just listing some here, prohibited content prohibited practices, restricted content, or editorial and technical. So when you look at prohibited content, I will say this, you're not gonna be able to sell drugs. Even if you're selling pharmaceutical products, that's considered drugs, and that's going to be prohibited. Or prohibited practices, like selling drugs online, that's illegal in the state. So you're gonna definitely get flagged for that. Okay, so there are a lot of different ways in which your ads can be disapproved, okay? But if you do see restricted content, then that means you can advertise but with limitations. And usually those limitations are restricted to, say, only Google search and not Google search partners or to a specific geography. So usually the key here is if somebody asks this question, okay, there are a lot of different reasons. Google's usually going to provide the specific or the reason why it got disapproved and they're usually going to include a link that you can refer to okay so at least Google does that much they're not gonna leave you in the dark and tell your ads just been disapproved they're gonna tell you why and include a link that you can go to figure out how you can best resolve the disapproved ad so what are the different kinds of bidding available in Google Ads so we already covered part of this earlier on so remember, Google search network is only cost per click, CPC. When we talk about Google's display network, you have three options, cost per click, cost per view, and cost per impression. And CPM is cost per 1,000 impression. So you're paying per 1,000 impressions. Impression is when somebody actually sees your ad. Cost per view is actually somebody looking at your ad for at least 30 seconds or the entirety of the ad. So if the ad video ad only runs 15 seconds and somebody watched the entirety, then you're going to pay per cost per view. So if your video is two minutes long and somebody watched 30 seconds, you're gonna pay cost per view. Okay, so again, let's go through these. Cost per click, it just enables you to set up a maximum price on the cost of somebody clicking on your advertisement. You only pay when somebody clicks on your ad. Okay, cost per view. Again, this is the default method to set the price you'll pay for your video ads. Okay, you only pay when a viewer watches your video advertisement for at least 30 seconds. And then cost per 1,000 impressions. So this is the amount you pay each time your ad is displayed in the search network and you pay for impressions that are generated for your ad, and you're paying for every 1,000 impressions. So the M is actually the nomor, uh, Roman numeral for 1,000. So that's where the M part comes in. So you're paying for 1,000 impressions. So every 1,000 eyeballs, you're gonna pay a price. And so cost per impression is good for brand awareness. If you're trying to generate a lot of eyeballs onto your brand, then you'd wanna go with a CPM model. Okay, so question 18, what are some automatic bidding strategies? So let's define automatic bidding strategy. Automatic bidding allows Google take over. Okay, not you, Google's taking over and they're the ones setting the bid amounts automatically. 
and it's going to be based on criteria and some of that criteria is going to be centered around conversions so if google bids on your behalf automatically basically what they're doing is they're collecting data on the behavior of your ads and so if your ad is likely to get the click or conversion then Google's going to set the bid amount so you can win that auction in order to get the click or the conversion. So there are different types of bidding strategies. But remember, you have to align a bidding strategy with the strategy of the campaign. So for example, if your goal of the campaign is to increase site visitors, you just want people to click on your ad and go to your website, then you're gonna have an automated bidding strategy of maximize clicks. That aligns with your campaign strategy. So this strategy automatically sets your bids to help to get as many clicks as possible within your budget. So Google is going to do its best based on historical performance of the campaign to generate traffic to your site. That's the goal. That's the bid strategy. Okay, let's take a look at some others. So, hey, the goal of our strategy campaign is to increase visibility. So that's an easy one. Remember, cost per impressions. Hey, we want to maximize how many people look at our ads. Okay, so target impression share. So this bidding strategy allows your bids to show at the top of the page. Okay, so you're getting the impression so people are able to look at your ad. Okay, so you're telling Google, hey, I want to be shown at least 50% of the time when somebody types in a keyword that I'm bidding on. So they're going to make sure that they meet your target impression share 50 percent so they're going to set your bids automatically to make sure your ad shows at the top of the page so it's seen at least 50 percent of the time that's the goal of the campaign that's the bidding strategy goal we set up a campaign to drive conversions so there are a couple of bidding strategies against conversions so target cpa so this strategy sets a search or display bid to get as many conversions as possible but there's a caveat here cost per acquisition is what cpa stands for so we're trying to get as many conversions as possible but at a certain cost for example if i'm selling t-shirts for ten dollars do i want to pay $20 CPA for every sale? Do I wanna pay Google $20? No, I'd be losing money, I'd be out of business. Okay, so if I'm selling t-shirts for $10 on my website, I'm probably gonna put the CPA about $2 or $3, again, depending on my cost of goods. So if I factor in my cost of goods, I'm trying to make a profit, then I'm gonna tell Google, look, I'm trying to get some sales, but I don't wanna lose money getting the sales. So you're gonna put in a threshold, and that threshold is your target CPA. And so Google's going to automatically bid and win the auction for keywords when they feel those keywords can get you a target CPA that you put in, for example, $2. Okay, so the goal of our campaign is to meet a target return on ad spend, meaning return on advertising spend, meaning we're getting more revenue than we're spending. That ratio needs to be positive. So Google's gonna help us, again, adjust our bids to make sure that our return on advertising spend meets our criteria. So we could put a ROAS as 100%, 200%, et cetera, and Google's going to adjust our bids accordingly based on the keyword that they think will meet that criteria of 100% or 200%. So that's target return on advertising spend. And that's there to see if Google can help you generate a profit. So we have another campaign set up. We're trying to get more conversions. We have a budget. We want to spend the budget, but we, all, we want to get conversions. So this is a gimme. The bidding strategy here would be maximize conversions. So this strategy sets bids like all the others and automatically is going to adjust your bid. That is Google. It's going to adjust the bid to help you win the auction based on historical performance. So if a keyword in historically has performed in terms of conversions, you better believe Google's gonna try and win the auction on your behalf to get the click, to get that conversion. And that's maximize conversions. Okay, moving on, question 19. And this is probably the most important question that you're going to get if an interview asks you this question, this is what Google Ads is all about, quality score. So what is quality score? So simply put, quality score is a score between one and 10, given to every keyword you've been on. And basically between one and 10, it's based, Google's giving you the score, the quality score of that keyword. And so how does Google come up with that score between one and 10? Well, there's three main factors here. 
One is expected click-through rate, the second is ad relevance, and the third is landing page experience. So obviously a higher quality score, the better off you are, okay? A low quality score, it's not gonna bode well for you. And so if you have a low quality score, Google actually will tell you which of these three components you're not scoring very well on. So you're either gonna get a below average, average, or above average for each of these three components that make up quality score. And I will tell you this, if I were to divide them up into thirds, click-through rate, expected click-through rate is more important than the other two. So that's about two-thirds of quality score. And expected click-through rate is basically Google saying, look, other advertisers have bid on this keyword and their click-through rate has been historically around, say, for example, 3%. So if you can't get 3%, then your quality score is going to suffer. Ad relevance is simply does the ad or is the ad relevant to the keyword you're bidding on? Likewise for the landing page. But the landing page experience is a little bit more subjective because the landing page has to load well, fast, no pop-ups, no a lot of external links, nothing spammy, no ads being served up. So a lot of factors in landing page experience. Google wants to make sure somebody clicks on your ad that they're gonna have a good experience when they land on that page. And so quality score is so key here. It is very key because if you don't have a good quality score, the repercussion means you're going to have to bid higher because quality score times bid equals ad rank. So for every auction, whoever has the highest ad rank is gonna be at the top of Google search results. So if you have a low quality score, let's just say one, and you're bidding $4 on that keyword, then your ad rank is four. One times four is four. So you gotta keep that in mind because other advertisers could have a higher ad rank or better quality scores for that keyword. So again, expect a click through rate. This just shows how likely it is that your ads will get clicked when shown for a particular keyword. Google expects a certain number here. You should always try to achieve the highest click through rate possible. And click through rate is simply how many times your ad was seen versus how many times it was clicked. That's all click through rate is. Clicks divided by impressions. So you should always try to achieve the highest click through rate possible. That will avoid getting a low quality score. Ad relevance. So ad relevance simply means how relevant is your keyword to the ad? Okay, so if you're bidding on red Adidas running shoes, then make sure your ad discusses and mentions multiple times naturally red Adidas running shoes. Okay, and remember with those text ads, you have three headlines. You have two description lines of up to 90 characters. You have site extensions. Okay, you have path one and path two. That meaning you can add additional keywords to the end of a URL. So you have lots of opportunities to make sure the ad is relevant to the keyword. And then landing page experience. Again, this is a little subjective, but hey, Google's gonna use landing page experience to estimate how relevant and useful your website's landing page will be to people who not only click on your web, but land on that page. So does that page load fast? Does it have any unnecessary pop-ups? Does it, does it have some quirky external links that look spammy? Okay, you gotta take all these things into consideration and think about the end user here. And then last question for search engine marketing. So what are the hallmarks of a good PPC landing page? So going back to landing page experience, this is a good segue. So you always wanna make sure you have an attractive and powerful headline on the page. Remember, it's gotta be a nice flow. You're bidding on a keyword. Somebody types in the keyword. They see your attractive ad. They click on that attractive ad, which has the keyword in it. They click on the ad, they go to the landing page. They wanna be able to see something very similar to what they typed in, the ad they saw. They wanna be able to see it seamlessly on the landing page. And so that attractive and powerful headline should include that keyword. Should also have persuasive copy that can convince prospects to convert. To me, bullet points always work here. Simple bullet points, easy to read, easy to understand, easy to just convey the positives about what you're trying to sell or convert. Have engaging media like videos. Videos always help because they're interactive. It keeps people engaged longer. Or have some really good images. Don't just go stock photography. You know, complement the video with some images. And then your landing pages should have enough white space to draw attention to specific elements on the page. And meaning don't cram the page together. Because remember, users are also coming to these pages via mobile. So you gotta take that in consideration as well. 
So cramming your pages full of content, videos, and images is probably not gonna bode well. So make sure there's breathing room for people to read, understand, and react. And those are hallmarks of a good PPC landing page. Some other factors here, adding trust indicators like you know, some statistical evidence, meaning how many people downloaded your app, you can always have testimonials, you know, third party sales of approval like Better Business Bureau, you know, privacy policy links help. Okay, so you want to add some things in there that's going to, you know, give you credibility. Okay. Having a properly designed lead capture form to collect visitors information is always helpful. If you're trying to get that conversion, then have a lead form. Make it simple. Don't have a lead form with 20 forms or fields you know have a simple name email address make the phone number optional and have one field that they can type in specific information and then last but certainly not least have a good call to action so make sure that call to action aligns with what you're trying to do again you're selling those red adidas running shoes if they're on sale then you know make sure the call to action aligns with that sale you can always say you know, 20% off for the next two days or, you know, $10 off if you purchase today. So have some good, strong call to action. Okay, let's turn our attention to email marketing. So email marketing is traditional digital marketing channel. It's been around a while and you're going to be asked some questions that are going to encompass a lot of things related to the delivery of emails. Uh, we all check emails on a daily basis. We all receive them. Sometimes we receive emails unsolicited. Sometimes we sign up to receive emails. Sometimes we receive emails from friends. Sometimes we receive emails where we're working or previously have worked. So most people have an understanding of email. However, as a marketer, there's a little bit of a different twist to it. So we have to understand the intricacies of how email marketing works. So you're gonna be asked some questions and really the first question here is what's the difference between a hard and a soft balance email? So if you're a digital marketer, you're in charge of sending out lots of emails, let's just say thousands, or I mean, it could be in the hundreds of thousands of emails, you're gonna get some bounces. And so you really wanna know the difference between a hard and a soft bounce. So a soft bounce just means that the email message reached the recipient's mail server, but bounce back is undelivered. So think of it as delivering actual mail to a post office. So it actually reached the post office, but it bounced back because maybe the you know person's email box was full, maybe their account was temporarily disabled, or maybe the email server wasn't necessarily able to handle that email. Now hard bounce is an email that that is rejected because it's an email when it happens when the email has been permanently rejected. So for example, maybe the, 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 the account is no longer valid. And so let's look at some reasons again as to why a soft bounce would happen. So for example, the inbox is full or the recipient server's down. So it reached the post office, but there was a problem actually getting it into the hands of the owner, so to speak. Where the hard bounce, a little bit different, let's just say that person is no longer working, their email's been deleted, or you the email has been blacklisted somehow, okay, as spam or something to that effect. So the email server is going to identify that and it's not even gonna reach the recipient. So a lot of different ways in which an email may not make its recipient. So not the most important thing to know here, I just the important thing to know is Listen, when you send out an email, you got to pay attention to how many get bounced back. And so next question here, what would you do to improve the click through rate of your email? So click through rate is simply how many people have seen your email and how many people actually clicked on a link in the email. So if 100 people saw your email, but only one person clicked, then it would be a 1% click through rate. So we want to be able to make sure we have a high click through rate. So remember, emails are going to people who likely signed up to receive your email. And even if they are expecting the email or they're not expecting the email, you still want to follow some of these best practices here. One is to create a compelling subject line. So you want to make the subject line something that people are going to notice, take note of, or take an interest in, and say, hey, what's this all about? That's pretty interesting, and open the email. 
So use preview text effectively. Obviously you wanna make your email mobile friendly because most people look at their emails on their mobile phones. You wanna create engaging content, okay? So the content that's in the email obviously is gonna have some links. So put some strong call to action in there and that's one of the bullet points down below. Place a CTA where it's easily visible. So keep in mind mobile users. Most people are gonna check that email on their phone. So you wanna make sure you have compelling content with good CTAs in a visible location. So always check mobile as well as desktop. Obviously in your emails, you wanna make them as visual as possible. Don't make them so text heavy. You can always segment your emails, meaning if you're sending out an email, let's just say to 100 people, okay? Maybe you wanna divide it up, boys or girls, maybe older or young, maybe you know living in one part of the country versus another part of the country. I mean, those are examples of segments. So break up the email. Don't send it to one mass email to everyone. That way you can personalize the email. If an email is personalized, the chances of somebody clicking on it are gonna be greater. And then A-B test your emails. And when we say A-B test, you know, you could send out the same email twice, except one segment's gonna say, get one version of the email, the other segment is gonna get another version of the email. And what are the different versions? Maybe the subject line. So the subject line is different on version A versus version B. Or maybe the call to action is different. So you always want to send out different versions of the same email to a different segmented audience. That way you can actually see which segment or which version got the most clicks. Okay, so next question here is how to inform your customers about company news and establish a relationship with your target audience. Okay, so again, how do you inform your customers about what's going on in the company and how are you gonna establish a relationship with that audience who's receiving that email? Well, newsletters are always the best answer here. So somebody signs up for your email, let's just say they actually purchase a product from you. Newsletters are a great way to reach out to that audience to get them to stay up to date with the latest product or an improved version of the product they purchased. And then that way they can come back and continue to purchase the product. So newsletters are a great way to reach out to your audience and actually talk to your audience. Uh, you're not talking to them verbally, you're talking to them via email. So you send out that email campaign, maybe it's once a month, hey, we noticed you bought this product, we have similar products, just like the one you bought, or hey, you know, if it's a software, maybe, hey, we've, we've got upcoming updates to our software, make sure you go to the website and get the updates, or we have a new and improved version. So all these things you wanna communicate to your audience via email. That's gonna get them to get to the website and that's gonna get them to you know, purchase more, update, upgrade, whatever. So newsletters, the way to go. So again, some basic tips here. You wanna create your newsletter with 90% educational and 10% promotional. So remember, you're sending out a newsletter to people who likely signed up. So you're educating them about your products. Always create interesting subject lines. You want, whether they know you or not, you want to create the subject line so somebody's going to click on it. So make sure you design your emails appropriately, okay? So if you know you're sending, let's just say baby products to mothers or expected mothers. In fact, this is a real life example because I used to work at Gap and baby Gap was you know one of the emails groups I was responsible for so we created an email template with softer colors your yellows your your light blue you know it wasn't black or dark red or, or anything that's going to be you know heavy we knew who our audience was and we designed the template accordingly and of course using compelling images so for selling baby products you're gonna put baby product images in there. I mean, it's common sense, but you'd be surprised. You gotta pick and choose your images carefully, especially if you're sending to an international audience because images can be misconstrued. And just like we mentioned with the click-through rate, you always want to have a clear CTA. Always make sure you have a CTA in a visible position because most people are gonna look at that email in a mobile phone, okay? And then always make sure you include your contact information in the newsletter. So somebody knows where to find you, how to contact you, where to go. Maybe they have a product they want to return. Okay, so you always want to put that contact information. Normally it's at the bottom of the email, but these are all best practices. So here's some examples. 
Okay, we got, you know, check out the latest cosmetics from our new collections. Notice the image and notice the call to action. So you can see trendy collections. You know, we got some other products you may want to buy. Okay, five important skincare products that everyone should have. View more. So you always want to have that call to action in a very visible place. So define following metrics, open rate, click through rate, and response rate, and forward rate. So these are metrics related to email marketing. So you're going to have to know what these are. So we already mentioned click through rate before when we talked about best practices for improving the click through rate. So for those of you that remember what that is, go ahead and put that in the comment section below. Just a little pop quiz for you. If anybody remembers click through rate, but let's take a look at open rate. So open rate is the percentage of the total number of recipients who actually open the email. So if you send it to X amount of people, how many people opened it? That would be the open rate. So how many people open it, but you're gonna take out the people who bounced it. Whether it's a soft bounce or hard bounce, okay, you're not gonna count those people. So if you had, let's just say 20 people open the email and you sent it to 100 people, then, and you had nobody bounce, then it would be a 20% open rate. Okay, click through rate, again, pop quiz. It's just how many people actually clicked on any of the links in your email, and that's just divided by the number of, of emails you've sent out. Okay, response rate, okay, so response rate is the percentage of the total recipients who clicked on the link of your email campaign and actually completed an action. So what is that action? Well, it could be downloading something, watching something, purchasing something. So that's the response rate, similar to conversion rate. If you're working in a digital marketing channel and you're driving traffic to the site, you want that traffic to do something. Well, it's no different in email marketing. We want people to take action. We're just gonna divide that by the number of emails delivered. And that gives you your response rate. So let's just say you did send in 100 emails, you did get 20%, open it and of this 20 let's just say one person went on to purchase well you'd have a one percent response rate and then a forward rate is simply the forward rate refers to the rate at which your subscribers share your email uh with others friends family etc and you may have that as a call to action in your email in fact that's a best practice so it's just the number of clicks on a share divided by the total number of delivered emails. And you're gonna multiply that by 100 to get the percentage. And so most email marketing platforms do measure forward rate. Okay, let's take a look at question 25 here. How do we capture inactive customers? What you wanna do here is re-engage subscribers with gamification. Opt for subject lines like, we have been missing you or did we do something wrong? You want to run a poll or a competition to re-engage with your subscribers. Again, trying to get people involved. These first three are all about getting people involved. So personalize your emails. Talk to that person as if, hey, look, I haven't heard from you in a while. How about coming back and taking a look at our new products? Just as you would a friend. So design always matters especially knowing that you're talking to customers who haven't been active. Okay, this is a segmented audience, somebody who's inactive. So you wanna have the right design, the right message, the right subject line that fits with that customer's inactivity. So you wanna try and do everything you can to get that customer back. And then you wanna follow a consistent schedule Okay, so ideally, when you schedule an email, you want to schedule the best time. So you have to know your audience, obviously. And then you can always ask for feedback. Why are they inactive? Why haven't they purchased in a while? So the whole idea here from gamification, like trying to, you know, make a game out of it, so make it competitive, to adding polls, to really personalizing it, these are all things that you can do to get your customers back. So 26, so what are the different ways to segment buyer personas? So again, when we talk about segmentation, we're talking about taking a smaller piece of the entire pie. So what's one way to break up that pie, if you will? By geography. Okay, so with geography, you could target your audience based on that area. And it could not necessarily have to be by a part of the country. It could be all the way down to the province, the state, the actual city, the county. Okay, if you live in a small village, okay, all the way up to the continent. Okay, so think about how you would break out the segment by geography. Now, obviously, if you break it out, let's just say in the United States to the southern part, well, the southern part, you know, in the winter, 
in the United States, the southern part is not going to be as cold as, say, the northern part. So that should tell you, hey, if we're going to send out an, an email in the winter, we're not going to use snow and, and, and blizzards as our theme. We're going to use probably a little bit of sun. So breaking it out by geography helps you understand where your audience lives. You also have demographic segmentation. And this is simply just age, education, income, gender, you know, where people work. Okay, nationality, anything that's going to identify that user. So you, this is the best way to segment. If you know who your audience is by income or gender, I mean, you're talking to a group of like-minded people. If they're all the same age from the same generation, then you could talk to them appropriately. Okay, you're not going to talk to an older person the same way you would a younger person. So think about dem demographic segmentation because it really helps you hone in on your messaging. Then you have behavioral segmentation. So behavioral is based on your audience's behavior. Have they purchased before? Have they never purchased? Were they searching for something? How long did they stay on the site? What products were they looking at? Are they a lifetime customer? So you can look at behavior and decide how you want to break out your emails by behavior. And this is a really good way. If you're not even sure who your audience is or where they live and how old they are, you could certainly break out your audience by behavior because you know who these people are based on what they've done previously because you're going to track that information with analytics. So, you know, one way is obviously if somebody's purchased, that's a good way to segment because you know these people believe in you, believe in your business, believe in your product. So the way you can message to somebody who's purchased before is going to be different than somebody you don't even know who they are, if they purchased or not. Okay, so behavioral segmentation to me is one of the, the easiest things, the easiest ways to segment your email list. 27, how would you drive repeat customers through email marketing for the below scenario? Okay, so this is a pop quiz, if you will. Again, for those of you that got click through rate correctly, kudos. Let's see if you can go two for two here. Okay, so if you know the answer to this, go ahead and comment below. But let's just say give a few examples of subject lines to drive engagement for audiences based on the following. So if I had an audience between 20 and 30 years old that were female, and the product were sandals, okay? What would some of your subject lines be? So I'm gonna give you a minute to think about that and put it in the comment section below. Now remember, this is an interview-based question, so you're gonna have to think on the spot. I'm gonna give you a minute, but if somebody presented that to you in an interview, you need to be able to you know, react fairly quickly and come up with some really attractive subject lines here, okay? so. Here you go, here's another one. Uh, so give a few examples of subject lines to drive engagement for 20 to 30 females for footwear. So you got Friday sale coming up. Buy branded sandals at the lowest price. Okay, so I like this one because it's got a strong call to action. Buy. Here you go, this is even better because 50% off on branded sandals and free shipping. I mean, who can't beat free anything? including shipping, and if it's 50% off, I mean, these are key things. So you're putting the promotion and the percentage off all in the subject line. So that's really gonna grab somebody's attention. Weekend sale for women starts now, okay, with a little emoji, that never hurts. So those are all good subject lines. They all tend to work because they all have an element of a best practice in there. So here you got, you know, the Friday sale coming up is just giving people notice. Okay, the stronger call to action on the buy, you're putting the promotion in the subject line and you know, you're using an emoji to really just drive home the point. So all these subject lines will work. And hey, at the end of the day, remember, you wanna test your subject lines. Okay, moving on to the next question. Speaking of testing, what is A-B testing? And give some examples of A-B testing. Okay, so we talked a little bit about A-B testing with subject lines. So simply A-B testing when it comes to email marketing, it's just a method to analyze which of the two email campaigns campaign strategies is most effective. Okay, you know, you're gonna do it based on open rate, you can do it based on click rate, you can do it based on response rate. Okay, remember, you're putting one version of the email against another version, whether that be the subject line, whether it be the content, call to action, whatever. So that's ideally what you're trying to do. You're trying to figure out what works for your audience. That's the end goal for email, for A-B testing and email marketing. What's going to work? And I would highly suggest you should always do A-B testing for subject lines, always. 
So some of the variables that you can test, again, subject lines, okay, you always want to try, if you got a, a promotion, hey, will the percentage off work? Likely it will, but let's test it up against something else, like, you know, a generic word like discounts. You can always test the design, you can always test the personalization, the preview text, you could try out images, call to actions, exclusive offers. What particular offer is gonna work? Okay, so if you're testing offers, then obviously that's gonna be response rate. If you're testing CTAs, then that's gonna be click-through rate. If you're testing subject lines, that's gonna be open rate. So you wanna be able to test different elements of the email to figure out what works and what doesn't work. Okay, so how to prevent email from getting into spam. So if you're an email marketer, this is your worst nightmare. You don't want your emails to get spammed. So that doesn't bode well for you. So most email marketing platforms like MailChimp or Constant Contact measure spam. So some of the important ways to prevent this is, hey, improve your open rate. Remember, going back to the first question, second question, you wanna have really good subject lines here, okay? And you wanna segment your audience. So if, you're, if you know who you're talking to and you have a cool subject line that's gonna get somebody to react and open, then that's gonna prevent somebody from spamming your email. Okay, you can always customize your from to make it look like it's coming from, in this case, Rob Sanders. Check if you have included an unsubscribe link. Okay, so give people the option to unsubscribe. If they don't have the option to unsubscribe, they could just report you as spam. Make sure your emails work on different devices. Okay, you wanna optimize your images for email. Make sure they're not big and, and they don't fit on a mobile device. Okay, prefer more text and fewer images and then avoid grammatical issues. You wanna come across as professional. You don't want somebody looking at your email like, who sent this? Why are you sending this to me? I don't wanna hear from you again, I'm gonna spam you. You wanna prevent that, and that means a professional looking email, professional content with a really good subject line and some imagery to go along with that. Hey, you may just get somebody to open that email and get them to convert. That's the idea behind it. So these are ways to prevent somebody from actually spamming you. And then what are the best practices for email subject lines? So the subject line is the most, probably the most important element in email marketing. So we talked about that little pop quiz with the sandals targeting 20 to 30 year old women. You know, to me, I like the subject line with the 50% off. So that was a number in the subject line. So people can actually see, hey, wow, I get a whole 50%. That works better than just a discount. Okay, remember one of those other subject lines had an emoji. So don't be afraid to include emojis in there. For example, when I send out emails using, you know, during the spring, you might want to use flowers perhaps to signify, hey, it's spring, winter's over. So personalize the subject lines. Remember, that goes with segmenting. So if you know who your audience is, your, your subject lines can be a little bit more personal. Okay, so opt for title case subject lines. Okay, so instead of making it grammatical, for example, okay, you wanna keep your subject lines short and to the point. Remember, you wanna say something that's gonna draw somebody's attention. If you make it long and drawn out and boring, then people aren't gonna open it. Develop a sense of urgency like, hey, we got 50% off through Friday. So that's a little sense of urgency so people know, hey, if it's Thursday, I better open this email and check it out. And again, grammatical mistakes, that goes without saying. You always want to preview your emails before you send them out. So if you preview your emails before you send them out, have somebody else obviously receive the preview, they can be another set of eyes for you to prevent any mistakes, but also give you feedback on the imagery, the design, etc. Okay, so these are all best practices for good subject lines. Okay, so subject lines are the most important element for email marketing. So just keep these in mind. Subject lines and having good subject lines is the way to get people to open it. And from there, that's half the battle. If somebody can open the email, then you've just set yourself up for better performance. Okay, let's turn our attention from email marketing to social media marketing. One of the interesting channels, Hot Trend channel, a lot of people want to get into social media marketing, a lot of jobs available, but you have to know what you're doing. So let's get into it. Uh, and here's some questions you might be uh, asked in an interview related to social media marketing. Social media marketing is very interactive, a lot of people posting information, whether it be a tweet, a post, 
uh, sharing, liking, engaging, commenting. I mean, a lot of things going on in social media. So some of it is going to probably be good. Most of it's probably going to be good, but every once in a while you're going to get a negative comment. So you're probably going to be asked this question. How do you respond to negative comments? Well, very simple. You got to be quick to acknowledge. Okay. Don't sit on it. You know, don't waste time, him and ha, on how you're going to respond. You really have to acknowledge the comment and start the process of constructive engagement to turn the negative experience into a positive one. So let me just expand on that for just a second. We know you like your brand. We know you like your product. We know you're very proud. We get that. I'm proud. I like to defend sometimes my beliefs. However, you got to put that aside when it comes to social media. Why? Because everybody is watching you and everybody can read what you write. So you, the spotlight is on you, not necessarily the consumer, the customer who wrote the negative comment. So you really have to be cognizant here and conscientious of what you post in response. So be quick, but be constructive because you want to turn that negative into a positive. That's really what it's starting with. So how do you do that? Well, how do you be constructive? Well, see it from the customer's point of view. Take off your ownership hat, if you will, your manager hat, and put on the customer's hat. Always look at something from somebody else's perspective. Try to understand why that person wrote that negative comment and ask yourself how you can make it right. So if you're the customer, and you are, your customer when you go to the store and buy food, you're the customer when you go to the store and buy clothes, when you buy a car, you're the customer. So ask yourself what you can do to make it right while you're thinking in the customer's perspective or looking through their eyes, if you will. To me, it's, it's not an easy thing to do, but it's something you have to do, okay? So always look at it from a customer's point of view. And then take it out of the spotlight. So really, because everybody's looking at you, waiting to see how you respond. And remember, this customer that wrote the negative comment can certainly share your comments to the world. So you gotta be really, really careful. I mean, how many times have we seen on YouTube you know, poor customer experience going viral on, on via video. So you just got to really be careful here. So take it out of the spotlight. So offer to resolve the customer's problems in an appropriate form. Offer up your phone number, an email, give them a link to a feedback form or get their email or phone number and call them. These are the best ways to really spin this into a more positive experience for the customer. I mean, at the end of the day, it could be something, something really small and silly, but don't make a mountain out of a molehill. If it is something small and silly, how you respond could make it into more than what it really is. So be quick, be constructive, look at it from the customer's point of view and offer as much support as you possibly can. Okay, that's how you want to respond if somebody asks that question in an interview. Some other comments here. So keep track. Okay, although the issue might be solved, it doesn't necessarily mean the commenter has gone away. So follow up with them. If you resolved it, follow up with them a month later. Hey, surprise them. Two months later, give them a, a discount. Okay, you'd be surprised. Positivity goes a long way. And it's always nice when somebody actually follows up with you after the fact, just to make sure they want to know that you're taken care of. And then don't feed the social media trolls, okay? So ignoring trolls across social media will make sure they don't enjoy the notoriety it brings. So don't even allow the negativity to feed itself. So that's why you really have to stay quick, constructive, you know, look at it from a customer's point of view and just turn this whole experience into a positive experience. It's an opportunity for you to hone your skills. Okay, let's move on to another question. So somebody may ask you to give an example of a successful social media campaign. Right? So if you're going in to interview for a social media manager job, you probably want to do your homework in advance. Look at what other people have done. So here's a good example, Spotify. You can see the Spotify ad here with Ed Sheeran. Spotify mined the search and playlist data of its user base to develop a thematic branded ad experience on billboards in 18 markets around the world. First of all, let's just take this and break it down. Ed Sheeran's popular. You can see here, be as loving as the person who put 48 Ed Sheeran songs on their I Love Ginger's playlist. So messaging is everything. 
Okay, and then you could see what Spotify did. They mine the search and playlist data of its user base. Okay, so they try to understand their audience. Going back to email, you gotta understand your audience. Okay, then they use that to develop a branded experience on different markets around the world. So they took an audience and they really marketed this around the world, okay, to something that was really hot and trendy. I'd love to see how this thing actually performed. My guess is it did perform fairly well because when you're Spotify, you're gonna pick something hot and trendy to get people to react. And so to me, this seems like, just on the surface, a very successful social media campaign. Here's some other things. Uh, you could see these ads were featured on the sides of buildings, subway platforms, along busy streets. So it wasn't just digital per se. I mean, they really went full bore on the billboards. And those billboards were everywhere, on the sides of buildings. Again, in 18 different markets. So you can see it wasn't just necessarily Ed Sheeran per se, but you know, they had some good messaging. Enjoy green light at every red light. That's pretty cool, I guess, if you're stuck in traffic in the middle of a city. Less fake news, more fake magic. So they really took and honed in the type of music, put some good messaging behind it, and really put it out there. So. It doesn't always necessarily have to, you know, necessarily be digital per se, but they, what they did was they did post this on the sides of buildings and subway platforms and throughout different city streets for maximum visibility for their fans to upload to their social media. Okay, so do your homework, okay? And, and on this next question, you certainly wanna do your homework. So if you're a social media manager, you're probably going to be involved in some Facebook advertising, okay? So this is a basic straight up question. What are some of the different types of ads you can run on Facebook? You know you can do single image ads. Most of us have probably seen that. You can do multi-product, lead ads, slideshows, collection ads, video ads. I mean, you got all sorts of a variety of different ad formats here. Okay, so let's take a look at these ad formats. Single image, again, most of us have seen it. Okay, it's just simply a single image that you know has, allows you to put some text at the top. A link at the bottom or a link to your website or your Facebook page and a strong call to action. Okay, so Facebook has that built into their ad platform. Okay, so the ad images need to be 1200 by 628 pixels. It's a pretty nice size image. Multi-product ads. So multi-product ads are represented in carousel form. So basically it allows you, the end user, to view the range of products just by scrolling. And notice each one of these products has a call to action. So here you can see Simply Learn offering up all the different courses they have to offer. So if you have a, a customer that has multiple products, this is probably the way you wanna go. So video ads are very popular on Facebook. So video ads usually range from a few seconds all the way up to 120 minutes. And again, video is very engaging. If you have video, use the video, okay? Because they receive about 10 to 30% more views than other forms of ads, okay? Who doesn't like engaging with video? Pretty simple. You have lead ads. So lead ads allow you to obtain user details like name, phone number, email, right in Facebook's environment. So it allows you to collect information right then and there. So lead ads can be effective if you're trying to get people to sign up for something. Slideshow. So we looked at those multi-product ads where you had the carousel. Slideshow simply just allows you to rotate different creative with nice imagery. So the key here is nice imagery. Okay, you wanna put your best foot forward, choose the right imagery, just like going back to the email marketing. You know, going back to pay-per-click, you wanna use some effective ads here and images in the ads. Okay, you also have collection ads. That's another option on Facebook. So collection ads, ads co combine video, slideshow, or product images taken from your product catalog. So I would recommend this for users who want to advertise several of their products at once. Okay, again, Simply Learn has a lot of different courses, a lot of different thousands of courses. So, you know, collection ads works for them. You can see here, you got social media certification, you got PPC certification, SEO certification. Okay, these are all different certification courses you could take at Simply Learn and they wanna go ahead and promote all those courses together. So lo and behold, Collection Ads offers the best option here. So pay attention to those different ad formats on Facebook. Okay, next question. How can you use the holiday season for social media marketing? Well, 
This is a nice segue from the previous question because you know you have on Facebook all these different ad types. So you could change your ad placements to ones lesser used by other advertisements. You can also set up clear, simple, and compelling offers for your users. It's the holiday season, you're likely gonna have some sales. And again, make sure your images have under 20% of text. Okay, that's a standard across the board. But again, you wanna have nice imagery. So think about all those different ad formats on Facebook, think about the holiday season and how you can accentuate your ads here. Okay, I'm thinking video here. I'm thinking a promotion in the video. I'm thinking a collection ad where you can run different products, maybe with a promotion with some nice imagery during the holiday season. So you definitely have a plethora of options, not just on Facebook, but across social media for the holidays, because normally you're gonna have promotions. Some other things you can do to really maximize the holiday season for social media, and that's make advertisements emotionally resonate with your audience. The holiday season is a time really where you reflect on the year, you get together with friends and family and it's religious and you know, it's a feel good in some parts of the world, the weather changes. So you wanna resonate on that, okay? You wanna resonate on that emotion. Okay, you always, holiday season or not, you wanna monitor reports to scale successful ad campaigns and obviously the ones that aren't performing, you want to pause. Okay, so with the holiday season, you're likely going to have an uptick in traffic, an uptick in eyeballs. So pay attention. You don't want to spend money for money's sake. So on Facebook, it's a cost per click model. So you don't want to be generating clicks without seeing any results. So go ahead and pay attention. Maximize those ads that are performing and get rid of the ones that aren't. Okay, and then connect the holiday with your products or services. So again, think about which ones you're going to accentuate, which ones you're going to make more prominent during the holiday season. And again, thinking back to the Facebook ad types, I'm thinking carousel or collection ads. If you can really pump up some of your products and have a nice promotion with them, you can run some nice collection ads on Facebook. Okay, moving on to the next question. So somebody may ask you, hey, how do you make content go viral? Okay, I always wondered that myself. How does content go viral? It's a great question. So really, you're not in necessarily in control, but you can certainly do some things to make it more appealing for the end user to go ahead and share it. I mean, that's what going viral is, right? A lot of people sharing it because the more people that share, the more people are going to look and find it just as enticing, and they're going to turn around and share it. So how do you start that process really is what it comes down to. Well, create short form content. Short form content is more likely to go viral. In other words, a 10 minute video is probably not gonna resonate with somebody. Something cute, funny, interesting, unique, out of this world in 15, 30 seconds is probably gonna go viral. So what does that mean? Make the visual content like images and video. It works better than bodies of text. So make sure those images and video are really compelling. And then run giveaways to draw attention and generate brand awareness and engagement. So you can always incentivize your users with a giveaway or some type of promotion, that's going to maybe pique somebody's interest. You know, share it with 100 friends and get 10% off, as an example. So these are some of the things you can do to make it go viral. Of course, if you're trying to get something to go viral, you definitely want to monitor behavior. And then tweak once you figure out how it's performing. Okay, you may have chosen the wrong images. You may have the wrong promotion. You may find that the content's a little bit longer than you probably like, and you may want to cut it down. Some other things you could do here is use some trending hashtags and topics on your post. So ride that wave, if you will. For any surfers in the audience, hey, two people can ride the same wave. So if you got a trending hashtag, use that hashtag with that video or post. And you can always ask users to interact, okay? So you can always ask them to like or share, especially if they're your audience. Because when somebody actually shares it, that means they're sharing it with somebody else who also has an audience. So that's a quick way to get the ball going, so to speak, the ball bouncing. Okay, so next question. Which industries perform better with different platforms? 
Great question. There's a lot of different social media platforms. You got your most popular ones all the way down to your least popular ones. I mean, let's face it, social media platforms are also geographic. So some social media platforms are more popular in say the United States than say India or Russia and vice versa. We know China has a lot of different social media platforms that most Americans in the United States don't even use. So you got to keep that in mind, but we're not talking about geography. We're talking about industry. So you got to also think about industry here. So generally with Facebook, it's, it's usually food and beverage, news and media, e-commerce. Those are the types of industries that you might tend to see on Facebook. When we talk about e-commerce, you know, it could be clothing. It could be you know, restaurants. Okay, selling, uh, or it could be a, a a food company selling you know foods and beverages. You also have Instagram. So Instagram tends to be more beauty, food and beverage, e-commerce. So when we talk about beauty, we're talking about clothes, we're talking about makeup, you know, maybe shoes, dresses, unique styles. I see a lot of that on Instagram. And then LinkedIn, for example, generally works with, you know, for me, I look at LinkedIn as B2B. Okay, so anything, you know, interesting in a specific industry, you're probably going to see some news items and updates on that. Tips and best practices, and of course, jobs. A lot of recruiters on LinkedIn. So... LinkedIn's a good place for you to really put yourself out there to find that job you seek, that social media manager job. Okay, so here's a breakdown, if you will, of the top five. Again, in the United States, you know, for those users who are watching this from another country, you know, you may find, I'll be interested in, if you could get some feedback here, you know, in the comment section of the video, go ahead and put you know, the social media platform you use in your country. And generally, what do you see on that platform? Do you see food and beverage? Do you see gaming or entertainment? Do you see e-commerce? So share your thoughts and knowledge with the rest of us. So next question, how would you measure social media marketing success of an organization? And this is a likely question, a question you're likely going to get, okay? How do you measure success? And that's across the board, not just social, but PPC, email marketing, display, affiliate. So really, you're always gonna have the right answer if you talk and think about conversion. So with conversions about tracking content downloads or sales or registrations or lead gen or form submissions, anything where you're gonna get something in return, okay? So to me, that's the general answer here here you know how do we measure success well it always depends on strategy but if you're trying to get a sale from instagram based on your beauty product or you got a promotion you're running on facebook and you're running a, a lead form type ad okay are you getting people to enter in that enter in details on the form submission so you always want to track conversions from that perspective and you also have engagement okay so your strategy may not be conversion maybe your strategy is simply brand awareness and engagement you want to know how many people participate in the conversation for example you may post something that's really you know hot trend it's trending it's it's political it could be business it could be a world affair you want to be able to measure how many people react how many people comment, reply, repost, retweet, share, like, etc. So engagement metrics vary across different social media platforms, but basically when it comes to engagement, you can measure it. It just has to align with the right strategy. You also have awareness. Again, if you're just simply in it for brand awareness, okay, it's all about how many people are actually looking at it, the total volume of people, okay, and how widely your message is spreading. Okay, what's the reach? It could also be just simply traffic to your website. So you can certainly track traffic to your websites by clicks or shares. So it doesn't always have to be about conversion or engagement. It can simply, hey, we want to drive traffic to the website. So 37, what are some things to focus on when advertising on Twitter? Okay, you can advertise on Twitter. Whether you knew that or not, now you know Twitter is a platform where you can pay for advertising. So what do you want to focus on when you do advertise on Twitter? Well, you want to emphasize urgency to make sure users take immediate action. You want to express discounts and percentages. Why? Well, because you're limited in what you can say on Twitter. You want to avoid using hashtags that don't pertain to your brand and product. I know that may sound like common sense, but remember you're advertising in here. So so you got to be really, really, really careful because you're paying. 
you're paying for somebody to either look at that ad or click on that ad. So some other things you wanna keep focus on is your ad copy. It's gotta be short and to the point, and then make sure your ads are mobile friendly. Again, just like most social media platforms, Twitter's no different. People are looking at Twitter on their mobile phones. So video ads should have subtitles, images in the proper ratio. So you always want to think mobile. Mobile, 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 because most people are using mobile on their mobile phones, whether that be in the browser or via an app. Okay, next question. How can you use social media to promote your event? Okay, so you got an event coming up. I want to promote it. So you're going to turn to social media, and the first thing you do is have affiliates, fans, and attendees share resources about the event. Okay, use leverage your community, in other words. Okay, you can remarket the event to potential attendees using Facebook ads. So you can do remarketing, and remarketing is basically, hey, somebody who's seen it or been there or done that, you're retargeting those people. You can use photos of attendees and social updates. So depending on the event, you can have some really high profile attendees speaking at the event or just attending the event. So use photos to drive excitement about the event. Okay, you can create a uniform hashtag that can be shared across multiple channels. You can mention the event, all social media bios, so don't just limit it to one. You know, cross promote it on Twitter, LinkedIn, etc. And what you could do is if you've run other events in the past, create a highlight reel from prior events. You know, show people, hey, your events are the events you must attend. They're the go-to events because they're popular. They're successful, good attendees, usually good attendance. And then some other things you could do here, share behind the screens visual content. And again, you could share pictures of guest speakers along with their quotes. Okay, so you wanna do everything possible at your, at your disposal, especially on social media, to really pump up the event. Next question, how can you perform A-B testing on your ads? So for those of you that listen intently on the email marketing part, Remember, A-B testing is key with email marketing. What are we testing in email? We're testing subject lines, we're testing layout, we're testing call to action. So the same thing here on social media, you wanna do continuous A-B testing to figure out what works and doesn't work. It's very simple. The great thing about Facebook is they got an A-B test feature built in. So you can certainly test different ads. Great thing about Facebook I like is that you can simply start out with an ad by running an A-B test. You could simply test the imagery. It could be a male versus a female. You could test the call to action. A lot of things you could test. So things you can change are again, color of the elements. You could change the positioning. You could change the audience you're targeting, the call to action. I mean, everything, everything, because the whole point is you wanna see which one works, which one doesn't work. So testing can be done initially on broader elements and then smaller, finer details like statements in your ad copy. So you could start out big just by testing the imagery. And so if the female tends to work better than the male, then you know what works in terms of imagery. Well, take the next step and start honing in on, say, the message. And then once you figure out what message works, then you can move to the next element, like CTA. Some interesting questions you may get include, what are some things to focus on when setting up your ad creative? This goes back almost to the A-B testing. You want to use ad creative that's attention grabbing and relevant for your business. So use a primary but bold color scheme. So you also want to you know, stay away from clip art. Okay, so again, align your Im imagery really is important on social media. Don't use some basic cheap clip art. You don't necessarily always have to use stock imagery either. I mean, it could be imagery you took that's very relevant and unique to your product. But if you do that, don't use low resolution pixelated images. Use images that are well lit. So decide on the aesthetic you want for your creative clean and minimal or colorful and bright, vibrant. It really depends on you know, the advertisement, what it is you're trying to promote. Okay? So some other things to focus on here, to create attention grabbing ads, show images of people benefiting from your product. And Coca-Cola has done this forever. When have you never seen a Coca-Cola commercial with somebody with a smile on your face 
drinking a bottle of Coke. I don't think I've ever seen an advertisement. So when it comes to food, you should always have somebody in there enjoying the food. If it comes to clothes, you should have somebody looking like they really enjoy wearing these clothes and they look great in them. You want to accentuate that with, you know, some nice coloring, sticking with your brand guidelines, okay? So imagery really is important here. So you do need to make sure the ad works for your brand without requiring explanatory copy. The image should basically speak for itself. Okay, so let's finish up with content marketing. Content marketing, another big digital marketing channel, a lot of work out there. So if you're going in for an interview, let's review some of the questions you may get asked. Okay, so starting out, what are the essential components of a good web content? Okay, so essential components. Okay, so what do we want our content to do? Well, we want it to be useful. So web content should be written in a way which caters to what the reader wants. Okay, so somebody's not gonna read your content if it's not useful for them. Okay, this because it affects reader engagement. Okay, so if it's not interesting, it's not useful, somebody's just not gonna read it. Plain and simple. It also has to be engaging. So listen, even if it is relevant to a user, you still have to write the content so it's engaging. So you wanna add elements like imagery, videos. Hey, you could even turn your content into an infographic. Okay, you wanna do something that's gonna be engaging for the user. If it's engaging, they're going to read it and engage with the content. Okay, and then co good content should have some call to action. So content must be written in a way that can drive call to action. Okay, so if you're writing a blog post, you know, I've seen a lot of blog posts just simply start and end with good content, it, but it doesn't leave the user with anywhere to go. So have that call to action. Put some internal links in that content. Give somebody a place to go after they're done engaging with the good content that you write. Okay, so some other things to think about, some other components for good content. Well, credibility. So, you know, anybody can write, but are you writing about something you know what you're writing about? Are you a good talking point, a good expert, or have experience about this content? So you also want to use, you know, information from a legitimate source. Okay, so you don't want to grab something in your, and use it in your content that's just not legitimate because it does hurt your credibility and the organization's credibility. And then also originality. I mean, write something that nobody else has written. So obviously you don't want to plagiarize because if you plagiarize and there are tools out there where people can easily just put their content in there to see what else is out there, see if somebody else has plagiarized it. So it's very easy to find people who plagiarize. So don't be that person. What I would recommend, create a good content calendar and come up with some ideas before you write them. Next question related to content marketing. So what are the types of content you can create? Well, there are a lot of things you can create. Start with the blog. Blog to me is always a great place to start. It's a blank canvas for your ideas, your thoughts, your opinions. Okay, that's a great thing about a blog. It, it, it accentuates personality. You can create a video. Videos are always engaging. You can create an infographic. Infographics to me are, you know, a hidden gem. Instead of somebody reading the same old, same old, you're laying this out in a very visual way. That's easy to understand. Create a case study. Okay. So if you're a you know, digital marketing expert, you know, done social media for another client, you know, write about it, you know, show the successes, show that you are an expert, show that you've created successful campaigns and social and in the form of a case study you can create a white paper. White papers are, are good educational pieces. You can also create an ebook. Okay. Ebook. Hey, if you have a lot of content, you want to lay it out an ebook's a good way to go. I and mean, you have a lot of choices here when it comes to content, a lot of choices. Okay. So what are the advantages of having a content calendar? So I alluded to that just a couple of seconds ago. So let's really break this down here because content calendars to me are so important. Well, first of all, calendar part of content calendar allows you to think about dates. So if you're planning something, you're going to have important dates in mind. Okay, so content calendar, it almost ensures you don't miss anything, you know, that's a good opportunity for you to leverage like, you know, Black Friday, Cyber Monday, you know, it's probably important, you know, when those days are if you're in e-commerce. So that's why having a content calendar helps. It helps you plan out your content based on important dates. 
or based on dates that work for what you're trying to do. They also help because you could stick to a consistent schedule. Okay, so if you don't have a content calendar, you're probably just arbitrarily writing content here and there. Well, what if your users crave and really engage with the content? They're gonna want more. Sticking to something consistent is going to really get people to come back for more. They know when you're gonna post, they're gonna be waiting for it. And if it's every Tuesday morning at eight o'clock, hey, post it Tuesday morning at eight o'clock, your users will get used to that schedule. And it, it does help build up your following. It does help, help build up your community. And in the end, cultivates a long lasting relationship. And then having a content calendar also allows you to mix up your content. Okay, so you can see and plan ahead different types of content in different formats. That way it allows you to mix it up. Okay? Whether it be a blog post, uh, an infographic, a video about different topics. Okay, some other advantages here, saving time. It just allows you to prepare for the future. When you can prepare, you're efficient. And when you're efficient, you're not wasting time. And so to me, having a content calendar is a must because a lot of us are busy. Who has time? And especially if you're going to work in a new company, so let's say writing content, you definitely want to have a content calendar because you're going to want to use that time to efficiently plan. This is a new company you're going to start working at. You want to understand who this company is, what they've done in the past, what you haven't done and what you want to do, okay? So all of that helps you plan and prepare and it saves you the time and effort and hassle down the road. And then at the end of the day, you wanna be able to figure out what works. So planning your post puts less strain on you and your team members as well as company resources because when you plan and you post, you're gonna get data. And then when you get data, it's either gonna work or not work. And if it doesn't work, then you know in the future you're not gonna put that piece of content or that topic in the content calendar again. It's that simple, okay? Some other advantages, fresh content, okay? So having a con content calendar allows you to always keep content fresh. Again, you're gonna be on a consistent schedule and you're not gonna be writing about the same things over and over again. So it could be just simply Twitter. If you're putting a content calendar in, or, in it together for Twitter, well, you don't wanna have the same tweets every other day. So it does ensure that you're getting tweets out there that are fresh, that are new, that are different. And again, figure out what works. A content calendar makes it easier to measure results and optimize performance. So you always wanna you know, maybe put some metrics in with your content calendar so you can see side by side content historically that has performed, content that has not performed. Okay, so next question you may get, what type of content works in each stage of the customer life cycle? So you have awareness, engagement, purchase, post-purchase, advocacy. Okay, so let's break these down here. So awareness, okay, so you want people to understand who you are. Okay, that could be a guest blog, an influencer helping you out. It could be a cold email, a, vi a video that can, can potentially go viral, a social media post, introducing a product. You have engagement. So you want people to engage with your content. What are you gonna do to get people to engage? Well, you could certainly write an email and have people open that email and go to your website. You can have an ebook where people can actually download and read it. Or you can have a blog where people can comment or landing page where they can fill out a form submission. You have a valuation. So with social media, we know there's a lot of engagement going on, but when you're putting content out there, you can certainly open it up to testimonials. Okay, you can generate white papers. Okay, or you can generate case studies. Case studies are a good way for companies to evaluate what you've done in the past. If you've worked in it for a specific product in the past and it's worked, you certainly wanna put that out there for potential clients in that same industry. Purchase, trying to get people to purchase, what are you gonna do? Well, you can certainly have landing pages, a, a nice you know website, a nice shopping cart with some nice content. Okay, onboarding emails. Get those emails out there and get people to go back to the website and purchase. Of course, you can have product and service details as well, meaning you know one, one page downloadable PDFs that describe the product. Okay, you have post-purchase. Okay, so people who've already purchased you could certainly send out follow-up emails. Okay, you can do blog roundups, you know, give people an opportunity to see what features or updates are happening to the product. Okay, of course, case studies of repeat customers. 
or content types that detail a new feature or service. Okay, so if somebody's already purchased, hey, you may want to send them some content of another product that complements the product they bought. So a lot of things you can do to engage with your user who's already purchased. And then advocacy, you want people to help you out here. So have the user generate the content. You can have exclusive discounts for your community. They're gonna be your advocates, so give them exclusive discounts. And then pictures of customers engaging with your products. Okay, who's not gonna share that? So you're gonna have people share that information. In other words, you can generate content where, you know, hey, people can help you out here and be your advocate. Okay, so how do you decide what topic and subject to write on? Okay, well, going back to the content calendar, that always helps you to see what you've put in that content calendar. But there are some other methods you can use. And you could certainly identify your target audience. And not only identify your target audience, but what their needs are. Okay, so you can write content based on audience. So you could certainly do some research with keywords. Okay, what's trending? What keywords are not trending? Okay, and write around what's trending, for example. Okay, you could certainly take a look at social media, for example, Quora. I always look at Quora. Quora is interesting, entertaining, informational. Okay, people are certainly having conversations on Quora. And you can certainly analyze those conversations because they certainly get in depth and you can decide, hey, do I want to write a topic around something that really just won't go away in terms of conversing? Quora is a good example of analyzing conversations. They tend to be a little bit more in depth. So some other things you could do, you can look at your competitors and what kind of conversations are happening on your competitors' blogs or, or your competitors' social media platforms and pages. You can keep track of blogs and articles from subject matter experts, commentators, critics, and so on. Okay, so you can get ideas from them. Another question you may get, which is very important, if you're going to start working for a company, you need to understand the tone, the tone of your content, because that is going to fit and be in line with the company you're working for. Okay, so you're always going to have a brand and personality. So the characteristics of a brand are the guidelines based on which the content strategy is developed. The tone of the content must align itself to the content strategy. Your audience profile. So you got you need to determine who your audience is. Okay, and how the brand wants to be seen by that audience. So, you know, if you have an older audience, you're not going to use younger audience, i.e. street lingo or today's lingo in, in the younger generation. Uh, you're going to use, you know, language that's going to fit the audience you're talking to. And then, of course, the channel itself. So the content you create must be irrespective of the channel and consistent with brand attributes. Okay, so you gotta pick and choose the channel. If it's LinkedIn, for example, hey, you know LinkedIn's more business oriented. Okay, so you're not gonna be, you know, as humorous as you would be, say, on Instagram or Facebook. All of these have one thing in common. Again, that's brand guidelines. You have to stay within the brand. What is the brand's personality? How do we want to talk to our audience? And what platform are we using to talk to our audience? How do you promote your content once it's live? Well, that's always a good question. Hey, you doing the, the work, the putting in the hard work to create this, you know, it could be a video and videos take a long time. It could be an infographic, an ebook. Okay, so send it out via email. Okay, if you have an, an email list, send it out and let people know this content's there. Put a link in the email or, or even a piece or snippet or preview of the content in the email. So you're using the email to broadcast and encourage people to, you know, if it's an ebook, get the rest of the ebook. Hey, you can certainly leverage social media to engage with your community. That's the best, you know, just as good as email. Get out there and let people know, hey, I got, I got my book published. Come and download it. You know, you can give a discount to the first 100 people that download it. Okay, you can always promote your content via ads. So whether that be Google or Facebook, you always have an opportunity to be more prominent by advertising the content that you have to offer. So you can always reach out on social media, again, targeting interesting people directly. So you can always interact with people on social. 
or you can write for others. Attract people from the web to important pages of your website by guest posting. So you can always go onto a popular blog post and write something and you know link it up or, or have it be relevant to the content you've written. So next question, how can you determine how well your content is doing? Okay, very important. Again, you've done all the work, you've put the content calendar together, you got the content ready to go, it's published, you're promoting it, social, email, guest blogging, but you wanna determine how it's doing. Well, depends on the channel, really is what it comes down to. So if it's organic search, you wanna be able to see if it's ranking for the keywords you optimize that content for. If it's social, you wanna be able to see if you have engagement, shares, comments, etc. Of course, you can always look at analytics and see how much traffic that blog post is getting or that page with the white paper is getting. Okay, so you can always look at your analytics and look at the traffic. Okay, and again, you can always look to see if there are conversions in the form of an inquiry or lead or sale. So at the end of the day, you want to align the content with the channel and you want to align the KPI with the content and channel. Okay, so if it's social, you're not likely going to get conversions unless you're doing paid ads. If you're posting organically on social, then you're probably going to get some engagement. So you have to align the right metric with the right channel. What are the steps involved in the content marketing process? Okay, so you really need to decide what goal you want to achieve with the content marketing campaign. So that goes back to what I was just saying a minute ago. If you have content, you post it on social, then what's the goal? What are you trying to achieve? Well, you're probably gonna get engagement and likes. Okay? You need to define buyer personas to determine the audience best suited for your content. Okay, so you're always writing for an audience and you're gonna market that content for that audience. So you always gotta keep that in mind. Okay, run content audits to, audits to determine the best type of content that can be used. In other words, how did it perform? What kind of engagement did you get with the infographic? Or did that video really, really perform well? Or do we want to use, you know, a blog post next time around or an image next time around? So continuing on here, you want to choose an appropriate content management system. Okay, so how are we managing all this content? Okay, is it WordPress or is it another platform? Okay, you could start brainstorming for ideas for new content. So again, that goes back to the content calendar. You leverage your content calendar to always create ideas for new content. Okay, then you wanna settle on a particular type of content that you wanna create. Okay, so once you come up and you're managing your content, you you come up with some ideas, then you obviously want to choose the format, and then of course, you wanna publish and manage your content after it's all said and done. So these are the steps involved. Again, just quickly decide on the goal, the KPI, decide on your audience, look at what's worked and not worked in the past, get your content set up in the platform, okay? Or get the platform ready to go, I should say. Okay, generate ideas with that content calendar, or I ideally go to the content calendar for the ideas, choose that type, and then publish and manage. And when I say manage, I mean, and again, going back to analytics or going back to the KPI that you align with that content to see if it's performing or not. Okay, so next question here, how do you target the right audience for your content? So very good question. You're not writing content for everyone, let's be honest here. So you have to collect demographics of your target audience based on who's coming to your website, based on who subscribed to your emails, based on who's following you on social media. So in other words, you have people interacting with with you okay in different channels and you need to understand who these people are so or do they fit a certain age range or generation are they skewed more female to male education level what's their affinity or interest okay do they have a certain income so you need to really break down your audience here and you could do that in analytics you could do that on social you can do that just by looking at your email list Okay, the, all those will paint a picture as to who your audience is. Okay, so good luck to you, whether you're at interviewing for content marketing, social, email, pay-per-click, SEO. You're gonna have a plethora of questions being asked to you. Hopefully these questions 
are well suited for your interview. If you guys were asked any questions that weren't brought up in this video, then feel free to comment below. I'd love to see what other questions are being asked in digital marketing interviews. Of course, if you have any questions, feel free to visit us at simplylearn.com. I wanna thank you for hanging in there and good luck and we'll see you on the next video. Hi there, if you like this video, subscribe to the Simply Learn YouTube channel and click here to watch similar videos. To nerd up and get certified, click here.